good morning, everybody, and it's good. To, we've got um, two or three screens full of uh, folks. Um, I'd like to, um, you know, just welcome all of you to the committee and um, it, um, the subject matter of food security and, and uh, that area, we're going to be spending quite a lot of time on and trying to uh, make it easier and, and better uh, for people to be sure that we've got adequate supplies of, of food and that uh, to ensure people that they aren't uh, going to go hungry. So, and uh, you folks all work in that uh, field and, and we uh, need to get your expertise and how, how to proceed. And if we need to change rules, regulations, laws to make it better for, for our people, uh, and easier to get the food uh, uh, material out to them. Um, I'd like to um, start off by having the committee introduce themselves. Uh, and uh, I think we'll start with Chris. You want to lead off? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chris Pearson from Chittenden District. Great to be with everybody, have everybody here, and uh, look forward to the discussion. Welcome, I'm Anthony Polina. I represent Washington County, and this has certainly been an important, it will be an important issue, important work in the next couple of weeks. Appreciate y'all being involved. Brian Collimore, representing the Rutland District, and what Chris and Anthony both said. And uh, I'm Corey Parent, I represent Franklin County in Alberg. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, senators and as uh, you folks uh, that are on can see we have people or senators on the committee from uh, around the state and um, so we were covered pretty well geographically and and we have committee members that are also like um, Chris Pearson's in in finance and Senator Collimore uh, is in government operations along with Anthony Polina. Did, uh, Corey, did they assign you to a committee or are you a floater? <laughs> <laughs> I float where I want to be. <laughs> <This happens here. laughs> um, and, um, and I'm on a, a appropriations because we all serve on uh, two committees. Um, I don't know if um, uh, quite, I guess we'll start off. We have a list of uh, witnesses and uh, we'll try to stick with the list and we'll uh, introduce you uh, and, and you can, and you can take over from there. Meredith Niles is the first uh, witness uh, on our list. And you're an assistant uh, professor at the Department of Nutrition and Food Sciences uh, Sciences at the uh, at UBM. Excuse me, Bobby. Uh, Samantha yeah. Samantha Levy is the first person on the list. I'm sorry, it was up there. Oh well. And she I, has to leave a little early. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll go to Samantha then. Great, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, hopefully you all can hear me. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me here at uh, your um, committee meeting. My name is Samantha Levy and I'm New York, New York Policy Manager for American Farmland Trust. So my work is mostly in New York, but I actually happen to be in Vermont, it's the second home for me um, all throughout my life. I'm in Wyndham County right now. Um, so, um, I, uh, like I said, I'm New York Policy Manager for American Farmland Trust and for Farm to Institution New York State. And uh, we work to help farmers um, protect their land, promote sound farming practices on farms. Um, and then we also coordinate the Farm to Institution New York State Initiative uh, that works to empower institutions like schools and other 
public institutions to commit to spending at least a quarter of their food dollars on food from within the state. Um, so I thank you for um, graciously allowing me to go first, given my time constraints. I really appreciate that. I'm probably a strange one to start off with, but I think I was invited here to talk about our farm to school program in New York State. Um, so I'm happy to go through that. I have quite a lot of information in my testimony, um, but I can give you the highlights verbally as well. Yeah. So, um, great. So, so uh, just so you know a little bit about me, I lead the New York Grown Food for New York Kids Coalition, which advocated for the incentive in New York, our, our reimbursement incentive for schools. Um, and I have also conducted research on the implementation of that incentive for the last two years. So I've got a wealth of information um, that hopefully can help other states in designing their own incentives. Um, so in New York, related to food security, you know, of course, we think of this program as a food security program um, and child food insecurity is rising as a result of the pandemic, probably why you've called this hearing today. Uh, we've also found in our research that half of a child's daily calories on average come from school meals when they're in school. And uh, so increasing access to healthy local food at school is a really effective way um, to improve healthy food access for all children, no matter their socioeconomic status, um, while also, of course, helping farmers and strengthening local food systems. It's a win-win-win. Um, and in New York, when schools, well, across the country, when schools serve so much milk and cheese and yogurt and apples and other locally grown products, um, of which you also grow in Vermont and raise, um, we, we just think it makes very little sense for them to be spending public dollars to buy them from outside of state when uh, they could very easily support local farmers. So um, this is why we advocated for this program in New York. And in New York, we've got two programs that work hand in hand to enable schools to purchase more farm fresh, healthy food. Um, so we've got the Farm to School Incentive, which you may be familiar with. Uh, this is a program in New York that quadruples the school's per lunch meal reimbursement from the state. It gives them four times what they would have gotten so long as they spend 30% of their lunch food costs on New York grown food. I can talk about definitions if you're curious about that. Um, and then we also have a farm to school grants program, which invests in training and uh, staff and equipment and transportation to enable schools to reach 30%, so it's a supportive program. And the, with these two programs working hand in hand in New York, we found that we can achieve a lot. So and, go ahead, Senator, please. And <clears throat> you uh, how, what is your budget over there for your farm to school uh, program? Good question. So for our incentive program, uh, we have a, it's, it's an entitlement program. So any school that meets it, it will pay them. Um, so we have a budgetary placeholder. New York is considerably larger with New York City. Um, so we've got $10 million as a budgetary placeholder in there for the incentive. Yeah. Um, and one and a half million dollars for the farm to school grants program has been appropriated for the past several years. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so within two years with this incentive, the number of schools that have successfully reached 30% has grown. This is a successful program. Um, in year one, we had seven schools apply. In year two, we had 57, that was this past year. Um, and those 57 schools combined spent five, over $5 million on food from New York farms to feed 90,000 students. And the average percentage was actually well above 30%. It was 39%. And there was one school that even hit 63% um, spending on local food. So the commitment is high. Um, and beyond those that successfully reached 30%, Plenty of other schools are purchasing New York products, so it's not just $5 million spent by schools on the um, local economy. And we found big increases in fruit and veg, um, and then also in processed products that use New York farm products in there. Um, Senator Pearson. Samantha, thank you. Um, I don't want to divert too much into definitions, but 
<clears throat> it's interesting. We have about 90,000 students in Vermont. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around the scale um, and what you're saying. One school got over 60%. Do you have a lot of processing? And is that, you know, that's not something I think we'd be able to replicate. Um, so just help us understand uh, some of what we're talking about. There's only so many apples kids can eat. Um, so you know what I mean, can you just help me understand like how much is it processed uh, versus raw produce or whatever? Sure. Um, so in those percentages, I don't have the exact breakdown of how much schools are serving raw versus processed. Though um, something that could be helpful is, uh, so the governor started the New York Grown and Certified program in New York and their definitions were borrowed for this program. So um, anything that is a New York food product qualifies and that can be um, raw, fresh or minimally processed produce. Um, it can be fish, it can be dairy. So if it's a processed product, the components that make up that processed product need to be at least 50.1% coming from raw agricultural ingredients in New York State. So um, it still does create that market. Um, and in addition, the decision was made that processing could take place within or outside of New York State. Since, you know, it's very common for these um, products to cross borders to process and then come back and be sold in New York. And on that topic, we saw an enormous increase in the amount of processed products, New York food products available to schools to buy. And that's not just for schools, but other institutions too. And things from local businesses and small businesses in New York that are processing there, like the New York Grape Juice Company, um, but also from you know, multinational corporations like Mott's or McCain's that are making New York applesauce or New York French fries to meet this new market demand. And they're creating that market for New York farmers for their products. Good. Yeah. Uh, and then just a couple of other um, points to share. Uh, looking ahead, in spite of the pandemic, we found in our research, and I put a link to my report in my testimony, that 75% of schools um, felt confident that they would reach 30% by 2025 with the right support from the state, of course. Um, and this would increase the amount schools spend at New York Farms to $250 million, feeding over 900,000 kids in New York State. And that would be a return on investment of $3.50 for every taxpayer dollar spent. So we also found enormous growth opportunities for dairy here um, in New York. Uh, so that's, that's an important point to make, particularly in the context of Vermont. And just a few things that we learned, and I put a couple of things to keep in mind in my, well, it was a list of five or six, I think, in my testimony. You certainly need a well-designed incentive. The threshold should be challenging, but not too high. And the financial um, uh, reimbursement should be enough, uh, fairly enough to cover the costs in order to spur action. Um, schools also need a support system. So the Farm to School Grants program is really important. Um, we found that positions like Farm to School Coordinators, which in New York are housed within extension or at nonprofits or at the schools themselves that actually connect the school with farmers or help them design menus to incorporate local products or prepare bids are really important since at least in New York, our, our school administrators are pretty strapped for time to try and tr troubleshoot how to procure local food and serve it to kids successfully. Um, also to help with tracking for this program. And then we also need capacity at the state level to do it well. You need folks who have expertise in um, uh, supply chains and guidance released well in advance to schools so they can prepare. It needs to be achievable, not too administratively burdensome. And there needs to be integrity in the tracking and documentation required to prove that schools hit the percentage. Um, so the benefit does go to farmers and kids do get that access to local food. Have have you? Um, this is uh, Senator Starr. Do you have you had any conversation uh, about uh, the? Uh, I noticed you talked about dairy. 
Uh, have you had any conversation in regards to moving to uh, school lunches, uh, whole milk instead of 2% milk? Is, has that been an issue over in New York? Yeah, we haven't really talked about that at the state level since those decisions are made more at the federal level, um, at least the requirements are. But um, we, we did find that there are many schools, not all, but many schools that are able to buy New York dairy, um, no matter the fat percentage in the, in the milk. Yeah. And uh, what about your distribution in New York? Uh, how, do, how do you set that up? Uh, so you're talking about the supply chain side? Yes. Great question. So um, so that sort of sets itself up naturally. And this is where procurement comes in. And, you know, as a legislative body, something that we often talk about in New York is looking at New York State's procurement laws um, and how they interact with the federal regulations that schools need to follow to buy food. So that's something I, I highly recommend taking a look at to make sure because schools um, put out bids and they're required to um, award their bids if it's above a certain amount to the least cost, most responsive bidder. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, and in addition, so your question about distribution in the supply chain, certainly there are gaps in our supply chain in New York that need to be recognized and addressed and invested in. But the idea behind this incentive was if the demand is there, then the market will respond. And we have seen that when it comes to processed products. Um, you know, I think that we are gonna need to recognize areas of gaps, like I said, and help move things along in processing and aggregation. Um, but you know, when you, when you have the, the number one barrier that schools say they face in procuring local food is cost. So when you have a financial incentive that frees them up to be able to ask for in their procurements local food following the regulations at the federal level, at the state level, um, and then the market is able to respond to that demand. Yep. Thank you. You're um, uh, Senator Parent. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Mary. Could you elaborate a little more, and if not, get us information on um, how your school districts are getting around the fat content and milk to buy local? I'm just interested in more about that? Um, you know, I'm really not sure, uh, but I could follow up with you if you'd like to. My email is in my testimony. If you want to send me an email, I can uh, put out some feelers to a few schools and ask them. Yep. I'll follow up. Thank you very much. Sure. Yep. Any other questions for Samantha from the committee? If, if not, uh, thank you very much for your, your time and uh, and we're glad to have you on with us this morning. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and apologies for needing to jump, but best of luck with the rest of your, uh, your agenda here. Well, this is, at least this is one advantage of being on Zoom. We can yes. get people like you from long distances <laughs> to be on with us. Um, Absolutely. And at any yeah. point, if anybody has any questions, please just reach out. Yeah, thank you for the offer. So we'll move on to uh, Meredith uh, Niles uh, from UVM. Good morning, Senators. Thank you for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a brief presentation to share. Yep. I'm assuming you can- Looks good. <laughs> can you see the full slides or do you see the preview version? We see them both. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Sciences and the Food Systems Program at the University of Vermont. Um, I've been at UVM for over five years now. And uh, some of my research focuses on food insecurity. And since COVID-19, I have worked with my two colleagues at UVM, Emily Bellarmino and Farrell Bertman, both in my department, to document and understand the impact of COVID-19 on food systems in Vermont and also across the country. So what I'm going to present today is just a brief overview of some of our most important findings to help give you some data about how Vermonters have been affected by COVID-19. 
And I'll just share that um, I shared with Linda, we have eight separate policy briefs that we've released um, from all of our work. So there's a lot more depth behind what I'll present here today if you're interested to dig into a topic a little bit further. So the data that uh, we have to inform our decisions here are from three rounds of surveys that we've done with Vermonters. Um, since March, uh, we did a survey of Vermonters uh, right at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, end of March and early April with 3,200 Vermonters. Uh, we did another survey in June with 1,200 Vermonters. And then uh, we did a survey in September with another 600 Vermonters. So we have nearly 4,000 uh, Vermont perspectives on how they've been affected by COVID-19 to share. What we found um, in early part of the pandemic was a 33% increase in food insecurity as compared to before COVID-19. And to share a little bit about what that looks like over time with our surveys, I have a graphic here to document that. What we have found is that since COVID-19, nearly 30% of Vermont households have faced food insecurity. And with our data, we've also found that uh, about one third of those are newly food insecure households. So people who were not facing food insecurity prior to COVID-19. So you can see the rates of food insecurity that we found across the different surveys. I should add that these numbers are retrospective to March. So for example, when we asked this question in September, we asked it uh, at any point since uh, COVID-19 began have you faced food insecurities? And in that most recent survey, we found that 29% of our respondents had faced food insecurity. When we look at who is most likely to be food insecure, what we have found across all of our studies is that households with children are significantly more likely to be food insecure. So this is data from our September survey showing that 41% the orange bars are food insecure 40, nearly 42% of households with children were classified as food insecure as compared to only about 24% uh, where there are no children in the household. We've also found that households earning less than $50,000 and respondents without a college education were more likely to be food insecure across all of our surveys. And finally, uh, households with a job disruption were significantly more likely to be food insecure. Across all of the surveys that we did, around 40% of respondents had faced some type of job disruption since COVID-19 in their household. So whether that's a loss of hours, uh, being furloughed or losing their job, we see about 40% of households have that. And in this bottom graphic here, you can see uh, the breakdown in food insecurity by whether or not someone had a job disruption or did not. So 39% of uh, households with a job disruption classified as food insecure in our most recent survey. We've also found some diet quality impacts. So food security is not just about having enough food, but also about having high quality food in order for people to be healthy and have the nutrients that they need. And in our most recent survey, we've also documented a change in diet quality, especially among food insecure Vermonters. So what we found here was that over 50% of food insecure households told us they're eating less fruits and vegetables since COVID-19 as compared to before the pandemic. So there could be other uh, impacts on reduced diet quality in terms of health outcomes that aren't just about having enough food, but also having good quality food. We've also documented how consumers have shifted where they've um, purchased food since COVID-19. So this graphic is showing in red, a decline in reported uh, respondents food sources, um, and then in blue, where we've seen gains in those. And I think there's some really interesting, important impacts here across the entire Vermont food system. So our consumers um, and respondents told us that uh, they're going to farmers markets less, specialty stores, um, and restaurants especially. Um, we also documented in our most recent survey a 6% decline in people telling us they sometimes or often choose local Vermont products as compared to before COVID-19. 
But what we do see are some potential new opportunities uh, where we've seen gains in people using grocery delivery, restaurant delivery, and on-farm uh, websites or e-commerce um, as compared to before COVID-19. We've also documented uh, an increase in the use of food assistance programs in Vermont among respondents to our surveys. So overall, we found that one third of our respondents use some type of food assistance program since COVID-19. And we've also documented an increase in use in those food assistance programs. I know you'll hear from uh, some different people in those programs later on who can talk more about that. We also found in our work that the use of those food assistance programs is more common among food insecure households, households with children, and those households with job disruption. So here you can see, we asked about in our most recent survey, six different types of food assistance programs ranging from SNAP and Three Squares Vermont, food pantry use, the uh, National Guard MREs drop off, school meals program, the women, infants, and children program, and Meals on Wheels, which serves older Vermonters. And you can see here the breakdown, and you have these slides as well for future reference, um, what kinds of uh, breakdown and who's using those programs before COVID, since COVID, um, or at all since COVID-19. And I have just a couple more slides to share. So we did wanna share with you some of the results about what Vermonters told us would be helpful I think there's three key messages here. First of all, um, as we asked about people's concern for food security and food access over time from the beginning of the pandemic until our most recent survey in March, or in September, excuse me, we did find in general, um, people actually had fewer concerns. You know, their, the grocery store shelves were no longer empty. They could buy their toilet paper again, for example. Um, but there was one major, two major areas where we saw increasing concerns uh, despite uh, COVID-19 um, in some ways at that point in time becoming um, less of a challenge. The first was uh, increasing concerns from Vermonters about losing access to food assistance programs. So we saw as more people um, use those programs, there's increasing concern that people may lose access to them or lose access to the extended benefits that have been possible with COVID-19 relief. The second area where we have uh, strong interest um, and documented evidence from our respondents is uh, increasing safety. People are still concerned about the safety of going to stores to obtain food and the safety of the supply chain. And that is regardless of whether or not someone is food insecure. And then the final thing is, is cost and financial help. So in our, in our surveys, we found about one in three Vermonters really do want and need additional financial assistance. Um, the numbers that we've documented uh, is about $149 a week for food insecure households and about $130 a week for food secure households. We also saw increasing concerns about food costs between our surveys. So a, a growing concern about the increasing cost of food. And here's a quote from one of our respondents that I think sums that up as I wrap up my slides here food prices have gone up. And so I'm much less likely to use the food pantry because of the increased number of people who need help. I try to find other ways to cut down, but mostly have just increased my debt and maxed out credit. And I think that's sort of a silent financial impact that we may not even be seeing the full effect of yet. Um, people who may be maxing out their credit cards or going into debt uh, to afford food. So just to wrap up, and then I'm happy to take any questions, I did want to share, we are continuing this research. Um, we have two future rounds of surveys planned to continue to document and understand the impact of this issue across uh, Vermont. We've also been working with uh, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, especially Abby Willard, who will be testifying next. We've done a survey of farmers and food businesses across Vermont, and we have a forthcoming report coming out um, looking at the business impacts on the food system. And then as I mentioned and I've shared with Linda, uh, we have put out eight briefs summarizing all three of these surveys that uh, give much more detail for you if you're interested. And finally, I just wanted to note that, you know, our team is very interested in conducting any additional analysis that might be useful for you um, or if there's any other questions that we could help provide data to inform your decisions. We're really happy to do that. 
So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. And Senator Starr, you're still muted. You're muted, Mr. Chair. <laughs> why don't we go to Senator Collimore? I think we'll go to Senator Collimore. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Meredith, I'm wondering, because we've heard different definitions of insecurity, can you tell us exactly what that means? And I'm also curious, uh, with all the surveys that you did, how, how did you reach people? Was it an online survey? Was it a paper one? Did you call people? Um, I guess those sure. are my two questions. Yep, yep, happy to answer those. Okay, so on the first one, Great question. You know, there's a lot of definitions and terms. You hear hunger, you hear food insecurity. It's important to clarify uh, those things. The way that we measure that in our survey is uh, through using a validated set of questions um, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So the USDA measures food insecurity consistently over time, and we used their six set of questions uh, that we asked at all three of our surveys over time. So there's six questions. I'm happy to share those with the committee. They range from uh, whether or not someone is worried about having enough to eat, whether they have enough money to purchase, them, all the way through to actually cutting meals um, in order to uh, uh, save money, for example, or because they simply didn't have enough to eat. So um, that is how we measure it. If you answer affirmatively to two or more of those questions out of six, that classifies you as food insecure. That allows us to be able to compare our numbers to uh, other numbers um, that the USDA has had over time using that same survey uh, methodology. On your second question about our, our distribution, you know, unfortunately with COVID-19 um, and with the University of Vermont restrictions, we are not really able to do in-depth work with people in person. Um, and so we have deployed all of these surveys online. Um, and we recognize that that may mean that some people uh, unfortunately, are not able to participate, um, and we fully recognize that, um, but it's been necessary um, to do it that way just because of COVID-19 at this point. The most recent survey um, was deployed using a professional survey company. I should mention that all of the surveys were representative to the Vermont population on race, income, and uh, uh, age. Yep. So this was a call-out survey. I'm sorry, say that again, Senator? Yes, this was a call out survey that was done by the, the group that you hired. In other words, how would people know to go on the website that there was a survey? Sure, so the first two rounds that we did, uh, we established a collaboration with a broad uh, suite of stakeholders across Vermont, including our state agencies, uh, the Vermont Food Bank, Hunger Free Vermont, a, a number of other uh, groups and organizations. Uh, we also did targeted uh, social media ads directing people to the survey. We also did a press release from UVM and did uh, media interviews on Vermont Public Radio and many TV stations and radio stations as well. Um, so we had a multi-pronged approach um, to get the survey out. Um, and then finally, we had paid ads on the Front Porch Forum, which reaches two thirds of Vermont households. Um, and so the targeted media, uh, social media ads we did were targeted towards populations we knew were not uh, likely to be on Front Porch Forum. Um, especially men and lower income households. So we had a very diverse strategy for those first two surveys and then hired a professional company for the third. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Hey, uh, Senator Pearson. Uh, my questions were similar about the survey. So would we consider it as good as can be these days, basically a poll? I mean, a, a sampling of Vermonters. Did you uh, allow for geography as well? Zip codes. Um, so we can tell you about the distribution. I can tell you that we've had respondents in all of us, all of our surveys across all counties. Um, I I do not feel comfortable uh, taking all of the data down to the county level to say it's representative. Um, it's representative of Vermont, and we have had representation across the state. Um, but uh, we can't predict food insecurity outcomes in some smaller counties because there's been. Um, obviously not as many people there. So we've tried to keep the numbers um, largely sort of at the state level. Although in some cases where we've had enough respondents like in Chittenden County, we could do that kind of analysis. But yes, it's broadly representative geographically as well. And, and are we tracking the country as a whole? Or are we 
worse off? What, where, how do we compare? Uh, we, uh, it's a great question. I've also, I'm also running a national effort, um, the national uh, COVID um, uh, re research team, food systems and food security research team. And so we have actually implemented this survey in 15 states across the US. And so we have uh, very comparative data. Actually, Vermont is on the lower end of impacts as compared to some of the other states that we're working in. Um, but nevertheless, consistent trends across all the states and nationally, the food insecurity rate has gone up. It is consistently higher for households with children. It is consistently higher for uh, BIPOC and Hispanic um, respondents. And it is consistently higher for people who have had a job disruption across all of our surveys. Um, Anthony, uh, Senator Polina. Yeah, just an observation. I was a little surprised to see that you found that uh, participation in CSAs was down a little bit and farmers markets participation was down a little bit. It's just that it's contrary to what we hear anecdotally where farmers have said are, that um, demand for their CSA has gone up. So it's just, I don't know what, it's, if it's a question, I just thought it was interesting to see that those had gone down as opposed to going up, which I thought they would have gone up. I, with farmers markets, it's a little different because people may not want to go. I, mean, I understand that, but it's just the CSA thing was just very different than what we've heard from other people anecdotally. So it's just a thought. I don't know if it's a question. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, one of the things we're trying to do in our work with, um, with Abby is to triangulate some of this. So we have this farmer and food business survey we've done. We have these consumer surveys that we've done. And so trying to understand like, who are the people who have been unable to uh, maintain their CSAs? Certainly there's been a growth with some populations, but others, um, you know, may, may not be able to do that. So we're certainly trying to look at all this data together moving forward to have a better understanding of that. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Chris? Yeah, sorry, Senator Polina makes me think his question, the, the date, that slide about where people are getting the food, was that among people that identified as food insecure or that was across the broader population? across the whole population um, and it was uh, you know it was self-reported so where they said they had food or they obtained food prior to COVID-19 since COVID-19 I'm certainly happy to dig into that CSA result to see who is it who are the kinds of people who maybe uh, started CSAs and who are the kinds of people who uh, stopped CSAs because um, we did see in some earlier research that food insecure populations um, were uh, possibly more affected by um, not being able to uh, utilize the local food system in different ways. Well, um, I would guess the agency has some of that information, but thank you. Yeah, um, any other questions from the committee members? If not, uh, thank you very much, uh, Meredith. Uh, you folks have done a lot of work there and um, I'm sure we'll use some of your numbers and figures uh, when we get to presenting um, the bill or whatever we do to move forward in a positive way. Uh, so thanks. Uh, Thank you. Our next uh, witness is Abby Willard from the Ag Agency. And good morning, Abby. It's good to see you and welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Senators. Um, I. I'm happy to visit with you this morning on a few topics. I'll say um, every time I hear Meredith speak about the data and the survey uh, collection that they did this year, I'm really appreciative of having such a strong research team at the university and focused uh, here in Vermont looking at, looking at food procurement and um, additionally on the farm and food business side. So I might recommend that there's a variety of different follow-up testimonies when the committee has time um, to talk further about some of the farm and food business survey results. Um, so good morning, I'm Abby Willard. I'm the director of the Ag Development Division at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Uh, a few pieces that I wanted to share this morning, also really cognizant of the long list of testimonies that you have on your docket for the morning. So I might recommend um, if there's interest for further testimony um, this session to talk about the agency's farm to school grant program in greater detail. 
Additionally, um, I'm going to give a few highlights about some pivots that happened in our farm to school program, our plans for 2021, and then a little bit about the COVID Ag Assistance Program that benefited farm to school. We also hope to be able to visit with this committee again collectively on our um, what we call VCAP, so Vermont COVID-19 Ag Assistance Program impacts and outcomes in the coming weeks. So um, I'll do my best to be brief so you can, you can move along on your list. Um, I also was inspired by Samantha's testimony from New York. I'm happy to talk additionally about the new local definition that was passed by you and others um, last session and how that might um, apply in any future farm to school incentive programs, um, as well as share how that connects to a US Department of Agriculture farm to school grant that the agency received to help schools look at tracking local. So lots of topics for us to um, engage on. So really quickly though, from the food insecurity side, wanting to think about two sides, both um, the activities that have happened in schools, and then a little bit on the ag production side, sort of thinking about where is our food coming from? How did our ag businesses fare from a food production side? So um, in 2020, the, the uh, Vermont Farm to School grant programs, which I believe that Betsy uh, Rosenbluth will talk in greater detail about, um, we had grantees that we gave a lot of flexibility to in April, recognizing that they really had some primary focus on keeping kids safe, healthy, and well-fed. And so there were a variety of grantees that really needed to take a break on their farm to school activities and focus on more of those immediate needs. So we were able to um, offer the opportunity for extensions if our farm to school grantees needed such um, support. Uh, because these were two-year grants, we haven't had a school take us up on that offer and have said felt like they have an additional year to do the work. Um, and also really important to acknowledge that the TA providers, um, again, a population that you'll hear from in this testimony and again, have been very flexible and have offered a lot of support to our schools in their farm to school program, both development and implementation. So our plan for 2021, briefly, we have just over $212,000 to support the program. Um, the uh, annual general fund appropriation of 171,875 is coupled with some philanthropic investments that we receive each or have, have received for recent years. Um, and we've elected to make some changes to the program that we'll just again, briefly highlight here and then happy to talk about in greater detail um, and might even make sense to bring in Trevor Lowell, who's our farm to school program um, manager to talk um, in greater detail with the committee. Um, so the, one of the first changes is that um, we're delaying the, the launch of our grant program. So historically they've straddled two different school years. So awards have been granted in the fall they get started and then summer break comes and then they re-pick up their programs again the following school year. So we are delaying the programs so that again, they'll sort of generally encompass one entire school year. And we're gonna limit the grants to, um, to one year. So with a holistic level of technical assistance and coaching that will continue. Um, we're adding a new component to the program this year, which really sort of focuses um, a bit on the piece that Meredith shared around the reduction of fruit and vegetable consumption and creating a CSA or a community supported agriculture program that's really focused on early child care funding, that's offering real nutritious feeding, op feeding opportunities at centers and schools with a real attention to that direct procurement from local farms. So the concept would be that a child care center um, or school would purchase a CSA share from directly from afar and the farm to school grant program funds would support to up to 80% of the costs for that share, um, no more than $1,000. So centers could purchase multiple shares for multiple centers, but the idea is to really make a direct connection between local food and the feeding programs at the, for, for our youth. Um, the additional program piece is really around a farm to school vision program. 
So wanting to create some real opportunities for schools to work with the really talented nonprofit community in Vermont around Farm to School to do something new and different. So they could really look at um, the impact of a particular project or the sustainability of their meal program, address food security, talk about diversity, equity, inclusion through a particular project. So looking to um, create some more flexibility in the Farm to School program for some of these unique partnerships. So again, that's all I plan to sort of share, um, sort of a high level um, intro with, uh, if there's questions or more interest, happy to discuss it additionally. So then I wanted to just talk quickly about the, again, the VCAT Farm to School grants that went out. And so there is a one pager here that I'll try to do a quick screen share. You also have access to this. Um, I shared it with Linda. So, um, can you see this one pager? Yeah. Yes, okay. So this is sort of an overview of the Farm to School Coronavirus Relief Grants that uh, were invested based on um, your efforts on wanting to allocate $100,000 of the Coronavirus Relief Funds in Act 154 which became, or H969, focused on um, schools and childcare centers. So you'll have an opportunity to, to look at this in, in your own time in greater detail. So this was importantly a collaboration with the Agency of Education and the Agency of Agriculture. So there was an opportunity for us to have one application for schools and two different funding opportunities captured in that same application. So a wonderful, uh, efficiency in state government on our side for there to be one application that the Agency of Education managed and ran and a real ease in application for the schools so they could apply through one application and access various funding sources. So it meant that um, upfront we had to do some important partnership um, but we also avoided any redundancy by creating the application together, doing the promotion collaboratively through the network and a variety of partners, as well as from the agencies of education and agriculture. Um, so really in the true spirit and genesis of what our farm to school um, efforts are in Vermont. And I would say <coughs> give credit to, to you all um, in your vision of yeah, allocating $100,000 for this program, both the concept, but also the amount. Um, it was pretty close to perfect. We received $118,000 in requests um, and we were able to award $100,000 um, of those grants. Abby, uh, any idea why um, five of the uh, applicants didn't receive uh, a grant? Because uh, I see there was 27 submitted, 22 that were awarded a grant. Yeah, so my understanding is that four of those 27 applications that were submitted were deemed ineligible uh, based on the legislative um, authorizing language. And then um, 22 were awarded, and that was again up to $100,000, which was the appropriation that was available. Um, yeah. And again, acknowledging that, that Rosie Kruger can probably speak to either today or at another time, sort of the complementary uh, infrastructure grant support that existed within the Agency of Education, which had um, far greater impact and more resources to, to allocate. So yep. what I wanted to share, and at least on this one pager was both um, the total funds that were requested, the dollars that went out the door, and then examples of a few of the projects. Um, so they were really focused on, um, creating a safe learning environment for kids in school during the pandemic. So classrooms set up um, outdoor spaces. They created sort of outdoor learning environments. So one example at Vermont Academy was a fire ring and um, campfire cook sites at school. Uh, some were able to address some of their food security issues in offering um, homemade snacks in the school by having a freezer and refrigerator installed. 
um, creating picnic tables and tented areas um, outside of the school so the classrooms could have uh, more isolated and safe outdoor learning environments. Um, so really great projects, um, really creative partnerships um, and important work that happened at a time when um, you know, schools were really um, struggling just to meet the basic needs of, of, their, of their responsibility as educators and uh, caregivers during the day. Um, so let me stop sharing here if I can. Education is the state agency um, that's responsible for uh, implementing all of the federal child nutrition programs. Um, so the National School Lunch Program, the Summer Food Service Program, the Child and Adult Care Food Program. Um, and then we also um, administer the uh, TFAP program, which is um, food that the federal government purchases for the Vermont Food Bank. Um, so we're, we're quite involved in this. All of these federal programs have lots of federal regulations. And so usually when you have me uh, come talk to you, uh, you wanna know well, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that with these programs? And the answer is usually the feds say we can't do that. It's federal money. Um, we put a very small amount of state money towards um, kind of supplementing and supporting these programs, but mostly it's federal money. And if we want the federal money, we have to follow the federal rules. Um, <laughs> and I know that's not an answer you like to hear, but um, but that's sort of the, the way it is with these programs. Um, and that's, there was a mention earlier of, of fat content in milk. Um, and unfortunately that's the case there. That's a rule set by the feds. If we want the federal money for these meals, um, we have to follow their rules about um, uh, low fat milk. So, um, but, COVID has been a really interesting uh, situation with, with regard to federal rules. So um, fairly quickly, um, when school, school started closing in March, um, we realized that the federal rules were not written uh, for this circumstance. And so we immediately started beginning to apply for waivers of the federal regulations. Um, and since March, we have applied for 38 waivers at the Agency of Education. Um, in addition, we've received a bunch of nationwide waivers. So first it was states filing individual state waivers and eventually USDA kind of caught up to it and realized that, you know, this shouldn't just be done on a statewide basis that um, nationally they needed to issue waivers and Congress gave them that authority to do that. Um, so the programs that we are running now look very, very, very different than what they would look like in a normal year. We have waivers that allow us to serve all children 18 and under. Um, they don't need to be a student. Um, we can operate open meal sites where any child 18 and under can, can receive a meal. Uh, we can offer multiple days worth of meals at a time. We can have parents pick up meals on behalf of children. Children don't need to eat meals in a congregate setting altogether. Um, they can take the meals off site. Um, we have some flexibility with a meal pattern. There's just a whole host of regulations um, that used to be just really strict and set in stone that we've been able to, to get waived. Um, and so we're doing a lot with that. Um, and um, programs have used that flexibility um, to uh, continue providing meals to kids. Um, during the spring, a lot of folks were actually delivering meals on school buses to households. Um, since the spring, we've moved more towards pickup models um, where households have to go to a location to pick up the meals, but we are able to offer multiple days worth of meals at a time. Um, and more recently, we have some programs that have started some really innovative meal kit um, boxes that are basically the ingredients for a week's worth of meals um, rather than individually packaged meals. And that's really being well received um, where that's happening across the state. And we're really encouraging that model. Um, since September, we've had the challenge of not only trying to provide meals to kids in their homes, uh, the remote learners, but also trying to provide meals to kids in school and still keep everybody COVID safe. Um, and so, and it's often the same food service program is having to do both things. They're having to produce meals for the remote learners and produce meals for kids in their classrooms. Um, so these programs have again shown um, just enormous creativity and willingness to, to figure it out um, and uh, they're doing it. Um, but they're, they're getting pretty tired and that's something that's always a concern to me. Um, we've really asked our um, school food service staff statewide to really keep working and keep pushing um, on a really high level 
uh, since March. Normally, these folks would have had some time off over the summer, um, but we asked them to keep providing meals over the summer. Uh, normally, they would have some breaks around the holidays, but we asked them to keep um, providing meal kits and meal boxes over the holidays, and they've done that. Um, these folks really are dedicated and really want uh, to ensure that children have access to meals. Um, but that's definitely something that I'm thinking about as we come up to this summer. Um, and we're not sure yet what this summer is going to look like because USDA currently hasn't extended these waivers past the end of June, although Congress has given them the authority to do so. So as the new administration comes in, we're going to be paying attention um, and advocating for um, potentially some extensions of the waivers to allow folks to continue meal service through the summer. Um, but assuming we get some flexibility there, the other piece that we need to be aware of is, you know, how do we staff that? Um, how do we um, keep these programs operating? We've asked a lot of our programs and we don't want to break them. Um, so that's something that's definitely a concern for me. Um, and, and the same is kind of, of true for my staff. Um, you know, we have nine um, child nutrition program uh, staff members at the agency and all of us have been working on COVID kind of nonstop um, and working on writing these waivers, providing technical assistance. We've done individual technical assistance calls with every single school uh, food authority in the state. Um, and we did a round of those in the fall and we're about to start a round of those in the spring. And we're doing that rather than our intensive monitoring that we normally do because we want to give everybody the assistance to be able to serve meals safely um, and, and well uh, during this time. So um, the, the, the team at AOE has really been working hard as well. Um, and I'm also concerned about how do we keep that going um, and I think my, my big ask for you today um, is really to keep it simple for us this year. Um, we are, <laughs> are working like crazy um, and I haven't even touched on all the different things that we're doing. I did provide some written testimony to you that talks about everything that we're doing. Um, and you know, if you're thinking about any, any new programs, any, um, you know, the purchasing incentive, um, I would just ask to give us some time for implementation to keep it as simple as possible. Um, if you want to provide additional funding, I've given some advice in the past, and I'm happy to do that again about the simplest ways to just inject a little bit of funding into the programs without adding a lot of administrative burden for us or the schools. Um, and to just keep that in mind this year would, would really be my ask today. So, um, <coughs> Have Happy you to... ever have you ever seen us do anything that's simple? <laughs> we have we have too many lawyers working for us, uh, Rosie, um, to keep it simple. Um, but anyways, I'm sorry to interrupt you if I did. did... Nope. No. I, I provided you some, some written testimony about everything, so I'm really happy at this point to just kind of answer whatever questions you all have. I can, I'm happy to talk more about any of those, those um, pieces of work that we're doing that I mentioned in the written testimony, um, but I know you've got a lot of other speakers today, and I would really love for you to be able to hear from them. Yes, and, um, and also, um, you know, when we get our simple piece of legislation put, start, put together, we'll have you in. Uh, to, to help us with. Um, are there questions from the, Chris? Uh, you have a question? Yeah, yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, our, our thinking is always as simple as the federal rules that uh, oversee the work you do, Rosie. <laughs> you know, this is where the complication starts, starts surfacing. But I've been thinking of you a lot because uh, as you know, I have elementary school kids, and every time we get an email from the school, you know, school's dismissed early, school, we have a holiday, but food pickup is available, or double the pickup will be available Thursday because Friday's off. It's really impressive, and, and I, I have thought of you often knowing that you're uh, well behind the scenes driving a lot of this. We've talked about in the past how messed up it is the way that districts basically pay food staff. It's different in a lot of schools. It's not part of the base budget, blah, blah, blah. You mentioned that you asked staff to work over the holidays to, you know, this, this burden that the, the people doing the work have felt. And I'm curious, 
are you aware of maybe i should know this but in it has the state in any capacity added money for these people who are working more or is all that burden fallen on the districts or is that one of the places that we've used cares money to help school budgets can, can you just help us understand that picture yeah um so under the the waivers that we've got um i've mentioned all these meals are free to all all children and that's because the federal government is paying for the meals so each meal is reimbursed at the free reimbursement rate um which is um around four dollars per meal for for a lunch um around two dollars per meal for for breakfast and that's so separate from cares money is that right yeah yeah so that's just the normal like child nutrition funding um we've, we've basically taken it's kind of wonky and I didn't really want to <laughs> dive too far into it, but um, basically the feds are allowing us to operate the summer food service program year round. And that allows us to feed any child 18 and under instead of operating the national school lunch program, which would just be limited to children at school. Um, and so when we're asking folks to you know, continue working over the summer, continue working over vacations, it's to produce meals and they get reimbursed by the feds for each of those meals. Um, I should be clear, you know, we haven't mandated that anybody um, do meals over the summer or over vacations. It's just a, a strong ask. Um, and that was one of the things this summer, you know, we asked you to help us provide some um, some in assistance um, in terms of equipment um, so that folks felt more able to provide meals over the summer. Um, and by the time that money got out the door, I think it was a little bit late. Um, so it didn't have as much of an impact as we had hoped, um, but certainly it was still helpful. Um, so, so there isn't additional state money um, going to pay for staffing specifically, um, but uh, we, there is funding coming in, um, assuming that that extra work equates to more meals served. Thank you. Any other, Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Rosie, I think our phrase maybe for this session should be do no harm. Um, hopefully we can uh, live up to that. I, and I'm trying to just understand, I thought I heard you say that, I think the bill number was S273 last year, which had the uh, pricing incentives for buying more food locally in it. Were you saying that you would prefer that we not take that up during this session? I think if you were to take it up, I would prefer a delayed implementation of it. Um, I, I really can't see us getting ready to start working on that July 1st. Um, that's just not something we have the brain space to work on. And frankly, the folks at the school level who would be most involved in that are the business managers. And these are the folks who are having to deal with all that different federal funding. They're going to be dealing with trying to to manage all that and the audits and everything. And I just don't think that they have capacity to deal with it right now either. Um, so I would certainly ask you to delay any implementation of it. Um, I did provide some pretty extensive testimony on that last year. Um, and I found, I do still have the, the written testimony and I'm happy to provide that for Senator Parent because you all, you all heard from me on that. Um, and um, it's, I think we have some significant concerns at the agency that it's far more complicated than it needs to be um, the way that it, it ended up written last year. And I know you had made some changes since then, um, and I haven't had a chance to really delve into that further. Um, but based on the way the bill was written last year, it felt fairly complicated. You know, I'm, I'm never going to say no to more child nutrition funding, but I felt like there were much more efficient ways that you could have spent that um, in order to get a good outcome. And so um, that I think we're, we're not against it, but it's, it's a, it, there might be some, some simpler, simpler or better ways to accomplish your, your goals. All right. Thank you, Rosie. And probably your plate is pretty full. Yes. Um, <laughs> so you haven't got much room to add anymore. Yeah. Um, any other questions for Rosie? If, if not, uh, thanks a lot, Rosie, for your time. And we'll, uh, certainly be talking with you as time goes forward. I um, will also mention, um, Senator, um, that you all had asked um, in a previous Farm to School bill for a report every year on local food spending. Um, and that report is due at the end of January and we are preparing to send that over. Um, so you will see that um, in the next few days um, from us and that hopefully will help you um, provide you some good information on what's currently happening with local food spending. Yeah, very good, thanks. Um, 
So we'll move on to um, Meg from the Agency on Aging. Welcome, Meg, and, and uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. I'm Meg Burmeister. I'm the Executive Director at the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging. Um, there are five area agencies on aging overseen by Dale, and those provide home delivered meals program to residents 60 and older through the Older Americans Act. Um, and then somewhat in conjunction with people who are disabled uh, through VCIL. The five agencies are AgeWell, the Central Vermont Council on Aging, Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging, Senior Solutions, and the Southwestern Vermont Council on Aging. So as you can see, we are cover the entire state. These meals provide a third of the recommended daily intake as prescribed by USDA. Um, menus are reviewed by a registered dietitian with oversight by the Area Agency on Aging. And the Older Americans Act long ago placed value on the grassroots approach to ensuring that community need was represented on a local level. And many of you see that. There are varied models of how meals programs relate to their geographic region in the state of Vermont. And several of the more populated models in the state do so through larger vendors and other systems use smaller nonprofit meal providers. When the pandemic began to hold, the home delivered meal system nimbly adapted to a rules suspension by the Administration on Community Living, which oversees the program at a federal level. And the rule was suspended stated that people who were over 60 um, had to meet criteria to be homebound and have difficulty or need assistance with activities of daily living or physical or mental conditions, um, making them unable to prepare food. With that rule suspension, that really opened the door to anyone who needed home delivered meals contacting us and being able to receive them. One of the complications with home delivered meals is that most of our drivers are volunteers and they, in many cases, are over the age of 60 themselves. And though we saw people decide to end their volunteerism, others stepped up to the plate and the programs continued without a pause. Increased demand and increased numbers of meals per week quickly impacted the programs and this surge has not subsided. Congregate meals moved to takeout meals for many sites and home delivered meals increased. Since March, we've seen between 25 and 40% increase and those, that range represents the diversity throughout the state. Um, and that has not really reduced dramatically. Of course, we all thought in March that we would be seeing an end in sight and the realities of our world now are very different than what we anticipated. We were able to receive funding through the Older Americans Act, through the Families First and CARES Act. It was a generous allocation and the funds came with a provision that they could be expended through the fiscal year 2021. Um, this allowed us to meet the demand. And as I just mentioned, we all thought at that time that we would see an end in sight. So we really funded the, that increase in volume um, using those funds. Those funds are um, also supported by two um, legislative actions that provided CARES funding through the state of Vermont. Um, this past fall that increase the amount we were paying per meal to the meals providers. Um, and currently we're working with Dale to arrange or develop a comprehensive plan for managing demand because the funding is not at a sustainable level. Um, the funds that we have received from the federal government through the Older Americans Act by and large are being expended or have already been expended in some agencies because of the demand for meals and the volume of numbers of meals being produced. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, um, the Federal Older Americans Act, that money it's being, I mean, they didn't allow you or give you enough to cover the cost of these meals uh, or that 25 to 40% increase in Signups has driven that away or used that money up. Is that yeah, the the contracts that we have with our meal providers, um, 
you know, sets forth a budgeted amount per year. Um, we certainly increased that thinking that we would be nearing the end of the pandemic at some point in this journey, um, and that did not occur. So the, um, you know, what we see is that there's increased demand every time that there's a surge in an area, um, that people are still very frightened to leave their homes to go grocery shopping. Um, and some people really have self-isolated just in an attempt because they're high risk in nature by virtue of their age. Yep. Uh, other questions from the committee? If, if not, uh, one more quick one. Uh, you have made uh, your request to Dale uh, and and I'm wondering, uh, we're we're going to have them in in the near future in in appropriations to present their budget. How how is your portion of that budget uh, being dealt with uh, by the commissioner? A uh, part of that is the expectation that we come up with a plan to handle. Um, both looking at the funds that were expended, looking at the demand, and then coming up with a plan on how to respond to that. Um, in, on a national level, what we've seen is that um, many states are now moving to wait lists or reduced numbers of meals per week to be able to contain costs because there has not been additional federal funding in the amount needed to support an ongoing sustained high level of meals. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for that, and we'll keep an eye out for it. Um, any other questions from the members? If not, thank you, uh, Meg. And uh, next on our list is John Stiles Stiles from uh, the Food Bank. Welcome, John, and uh, good to see you, and be glad to hear from you. Uh, welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I was wondering if it's okay, Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to uh, defer um, my testimony. Um, oh, did Carol just pop off? Oh, there she is. No. The Carol Kent. Oh, you, you turned your video on uh, so that we can keep the school stuff closer together and make it uh, flow a little more. Would that be okay? Sure. And um, yeah, that, that would be great. Thank you, John. You're welcome. So, Carol. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carol Kent, and I'm president of the School Nutrition Association of Vermont. Um, we're affiliate of the National um, School Nutrition Association. Um, I'm also director of School Nutrition at Lamoille North Supervisory Union. Um, I just want to. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to talk to you all and share with you what's actually going on in the schools and how we are affecting families and our communities. Um, I want to give a big shout out to the AOE Child Nutrition Team who have been working with us um, since the moment this dropped on us back in March. Um, weekly calls with school nutrition professionals across the state. Um, and helping us navigate all the waivers that have come our way. Um, I, I don't have to tell you that back in March when this first happened, um, you've heard the stories of how school nutrition teams sprung into action, how we came to the call delivering meals on buses, curbside pickups, um, it, it was monumental and we barely stopped. Um, there has really, as, as Rosie said, there's hardly been a vacation break for anybody. Um, and our teams, our, our cooks, they're, they're happy to do it. Um, they are essential. And the work we're doing is just what motivates us because these are our neighbors. And these are our kids. Um, when we started back, well, let me back up. The waiver to serve meals for free to all kids 18 and under was a godsend. And it really kind of set a precedent of what communities and what schools need to do to care for their children. 
when we started back to school in the fall, um, those waivers had ended and we were really afraid. And as school food service directors weren't afraid of the virus and we were not afraid of all the revenue we were probably going to be losing. We were really afraid that kids who were on free and reduced meals were really going to be overtly identified in the classroom. Because with meals going back to um, being free, reduced, or full priced, it was probably mostly free and reduced kids that were going to be eating meals in the classroom. And it would be known to everybody who was low income. That was our greatest fear. And how were we going to deal with that? So when the waiver came back to do the summer food service program and meals were free again, <clears throat> it was just a huge weight off the shoulders of everybody. And if I could take just a moment to read you a statement from one of my teachers, it kind of sums it up. And she said, I have 10th graders in our high poverty school. When I told them on the first day that school lunches would be free, I saw the relief on many faces. They didn't have to think about hunting through the fridge and cabinets at home, trying to scrounge up something to bring for lunch. And some of them laughed out loud, telling me that this was great news because they hadn't brought anything in for lunch and they were just going to go without. <clears throat> Every other week or so, one of the students would check in with me again on this. Our school lunch is still free. There was a fear that the program had ended and that they wouldn't know and their families would wind up with a bill they couldn't afford. And as winter break approached in the end of 2020, I fielded that question again and again as students wanted reassurance the program would continue through the new year. So these free lunches were more than just fuel, more than nutrition. They were about our reassurance that they wouldn't go hungry, that adults would take care of them, that their school was a safe place and that the pandemic wouldn't win, that it was all going to be okay. And those free lunches meant family and community and hope. And the reason I share that is because we're beginning to become fearful again of what happens when the free meals stop. And how do we tell these kids that we can't feed them lunch? Um, our big ask is for universal school meals. And it's a really big ask. And we understand that at the state level, that's gonna take a, a lot of innovation, reinvention, a lot of work. Um, we would like that to come down from the federal level, but if it doesn't, we're really asking Vermont to step up and try to find a way to continue feeding all kids for free. It has eliminated the stigma in schools. It's eliminated shame. Um, it's eliminated kids being hungry, kids hiding food, teachers paying for school meals. Um, all those things that you see in the data from Hunger Free Vermont has borne out. It, it happens. Um, our kids are more attentive. I, I have pages and pages of statements from teachers and principals um, and from parents. Kids' attention oh. level is focused and they're learning better. Um, they're prepared throughout their day. And, um, and that's because they don't have to worry about their parents getting a big bill um, and where the next meal's coming from. Yep. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank you all for the equipment grants. That was a huge help um, at a time when we really needed it. Um, and the farm to school uh, grants were also just really, really important to us. Um, we would like to, I'd like to also share that we got caught up in the beginning of the school year with the supply chain issues of getting the produce that we needed um, as they did across the country. And we were able to turn to our local farms for produce and vegetables we needed. Um, what made it possible to do that was the extra reimbursement that we received from the summer food service program. That little bit of extra money made it possible for us to make more purchases locally and to support our local farms. Um, up here in Lamoille, we've been purchasing from West Farm, Green Mountain Farm Direct, 
um, Kingdom Creamery and, and so on. So that's been extra money going right into our communities and it, they've acknowledged what a big help that's been for them. Um, so we'd like to speak in support of the Vermont Food for Vermont Kids program, the local pur purchasing initiative. Um, when we can make that happen, it'll be a great benefit to all of our schools and all of our farmers. Um, yeah. Parents have shared with us that the food they're getting in the meal kits, because um, many of us are doing bulk meal kits to send home. They're getting a lot of local produce that they've never tried before. Fresh food, fruit and vegetables that they typically can't afford to purchase and that kids are eating more healthfully at home than they have before. They're cooking together as families. They're learning how to cook kale and how to cook leeks and um, other root vegetables. So it's been a win-win. The pandemic has opened up so many opportunities um, for us to respond locally and healthfully and just bring our, our families so much support. Um, yeah. Well, know? thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony and thoughts. And yeah, it has been great having the Universal Meals programs since last March. It's worked out very well. Uh, of course, our committee supports that um, very much. Uh, the big issue is, of course, trying to find the money to uh, pay for it. And um, but anyhow, uh, it's been a good um, a good run uh, trying Universal Meals uh, out, and and we've had certainly uh, good participation. So, th are there any other uh, questions from the committee? Um, we've we've got to wrap this up, uh, but like in by ten forty. Uh, so we got eight or 10 minutes left and then uh, we got to switch over. But what, um, and for those, I don't know who wants to go next. If John, you want to be up next and, and but we're going to get the rest of you back in. Uh, it probably will be just early next week. Thank you, Mr. So, Chairman. Go oh, now, John, and of course, if you if you need to, you can come back next week too if you have time. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I can get everything in in just a few minutes. Um, and uh, thank you, committee members, for holding this hearing today and all the other um, all the other testimony. I mean, it's uh, obviously it's we don't have to say that this is something in Vermont that we can do something about, and we are. Um, particular thanks to Professor Niles uh, for all the research they've done, which is really helpful in kind of letting us understand the extent of the, of the issue here and to show what we can do. Um, also, I want to say that my testimony is on the site along with some supporting documentation and that, that under Faye Mac's name, there is an overview of all the asks and I'm going to have a couple of asks here. Uh, so I just want to let you know what the food bank's been doing. We're really grateful for the support of the state, um, uh, particularly since March when, uh, when, you know, everything hit the fan and uh, uh, the, the National Guard and the state EO, uh, SEOC and uh, the Agency of Human Services and the legislature with CARES Act funding. It's just been an outpouring of support and allowed the food bank to respond in the way that we really wanted to. Um, and we continue to. Um, this hunger crisis is not going away. And, uh, you know, what, we were at one in 10 people food insecure. Now we're at one in three, maybe one in four. Um, it's going to take a long time. I, I know there was some testimony about people maxing out their credit cards um, to, to buy food. And it takes a long time for people to recover from that. Um, so, so we'll be here for the long run. Uh, the food bank to address that increased need has doubled our distribution since March um, for, for fresh food uh, or excuse me, local food, um, fresh local food. It's up 63% from last year. Um, and our, our fiscal year ends in, in, uh, in September and this first quarter of the new year, 
um, our fresh food distribution is up 77%. So we're out there. Uh, because of the CARES Act funding and other food bank support, um, we spent in the last fiscal year $975,000 on local food from Vermont growers and producers um, and uh, hope to continue um, a, a really high level of, of partnership with our Vermont growers. Um, we also have been providing many grants to food shelves and meal sites in all of your communities. And those are grants of, you know, a, a, between the thousand dollars and maybe up to ten thousand dollars, where the local food shelf or meal site can then purchase directly from a small farmer. Um, some of the farms are are really a little too small for the food bank's logistical um, nightmare, <laughs> um, and so it's it's it makes a lot more sense for for the parent child center or the food shelf or the meal site in that community to to get a CSA or local deliveries. There are, I'll get right to the asks because I know we're really short on time. There are three ways that the state can continue to help the food bank and support our neighbors here in Vermont. One is the food bank is right now conducting our own, we're calling it the Vermont Farmers to Families program where we're doing 500 food boxes a day for eight weeks at locations all over the state, uh, working with the Abbey Group and those boxes include at least 50% Vermont product. Uh, that's a $1.5 million program and our request uh, that we've talked to the administration about also is to get um, some funding to support that through the Budget Adjustment Act um, or perhaps if there's any uh, additional CARES Act funding or from additional federal funding that comes in. Um, again, we were at, at the legislature last year and we'll be there again this year. Um, as the food bank asking for a $500,000 annual appropriation for Vermonters feeding Vermonters. And every dollar of that money will go directly to purchasing uh, food from Vermont growers and producers that would then be distributed within the food bank system. Uh, finally, if more federal funding does become available, the food bank has a, uh, a budget to keep us uh, producing and getting food out at, at these pandemic levels. And that will be about $7 million. Uh, that includes that $1.5 million uh, for the uh, Vermonters, uh, Vermont Farmers to Families program. Um, and what do we do? We have 20 monthly and twice a month distributions for our Veggie Van Gogh program. We uh, partner with 215 food shelves and meal sites all across the state in each of your communities. Um, we supply food to 42 SASH housing sites around the state. And there's a, a program that provides 55 CSA shares of culturally responsive food to new American communities in the Burlington area um, and, and a lot more. Um, but we don't have time to talk about that. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, well, thank you, John. And, and um, Thank you for all the work you've been doing uh, with our food shelves and around the state uh, since last spring. And uh, I, think, I think we should be proud, we as Vermonters are proud of taking care of our own citizens and making sure that, um, that no one goes hungry. Um, the, um, I'm wondering uh, if um, Helen and Betsy and Faye and any of the rest of you could come back another day. I, I, I'm sorry that we, I guess we should have started earlier or gone longer and, and moved things, but it's, uh, it's a very trying time and in our time, um, but we're going to be spending, we as a committee, a lot of time on food security, and and we're going to be working, of course, with all of you folks and uh, and other partners to uh, get make sure we get this as right as possible. Um, I don't know if uh, Chris, did you have a question? Yeah, or sorry, just a quick question for John. Um, thank you for all the vital work you're doing. I'd heard from a constituent who's uh, got celiac, I think is how you say it, uh, uh, a little like Crohn's, yeah. and finds it and is, is uh, 
got low income and dependent on food food bank and says it can be quite hard to find appropriate food. Could you just comment on that? Is there any plan? You know, I'm sure he's not alone. It's obviously hard. You're juggling a lot of uh, competing pressures, but just wondered if you had any thoughts and, and any plan to help somebody like him out. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, celiac uh, are people who don't or cannot tolerate gluten. And as we know, and when it comes to um, processed foods of any kind, there's generally gluten in them. And so um, it's very, very challenging uh, for us to have separate um, uh, enough of, of food that is certified gluten-free and to make it available to all of our partners in a way that's, that's equitable. Um, I would actually, if you would, if you would refer the, 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 um, the person to, to me, I'd be happy to work with them and figure out um, where in their area is the best place um, to get more of the, the kinds of foods that they can, that they can tolerate. Um, this, is, this is not just a problem in Vermont with food banks and the charitable food system. It's a problem across the country um, and uh, just a really challenging one. It, it's hard for people who have plenty of income and have celiac disease um, and I just, it's just, you know, really, really challenging when, when you have really limited, limited means. I'll, I'll try to connect him with you by email. Thanks, John. Yeah, any, anything else uh, from the committee? If not, I want to thank all, all of you folks for being with us this morning and we'll uh, be sending out invitations uh, for our meeting next week when we work on um, foods. So thanks again, and sorry that we couldn't get everybody through this morning, but it certainly shows that this is a very uh, serious you know, subject matter and that uh, we're trying to take it serious and in working with all you, we can, I know we can build up a better system of food supplies for our people. So thanks again for being with us. Um, committee members, I don't, would you like to take a couple of minute break? And, and uh, then we have the uh, Vermont um, Dairy uh, Producers Alliance with us. And I see Amanda's already on. And, and so we'll be, Hopefully getting going by 1045 or, or shortly uh, thereafter. So if you'd like to just stop for a minute to catch your breath, uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a little break. Um, we may as well get started. We can, we've got an hour and 15 minutes or so to hear from you folks. And it's good to see all of you and you're certainly all very welcome. So um, I don't know if you want to go according to the way the list is set up, but I have Amanda first and Brian and and uh, uh, Bordeaux and then the Hills. And but if you want to switch around because of time, um, just speak up and we'll we'll take care of it. So with that, Amanda, thank you for being with us and be glad to um, hear hear from you. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, committee. Um, I, we will have to do some change-ups. We had uh, one young member who's, um, we were excited to offer testimony today that's having a hard time with technology. We're buried in snow here and um, he's having some, some difficulties with his phone line being down and different things. So Caden DeBurge, I'm not sure will be joining us and um, Jacob Bordeaux, I'm not sure as well. He was um, in another meeting. So we'll play it by ear. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping Josh Poulin can join us. He was on the House Committee earlier. So uh, I appreciate the fluctuation that you're allowing us today. Um, but to get started. Um, Before you start, um, we do have a new member on the committee, uh, Senator Parent from St. Albans. The rest of us have been together for the last two or three years. And so I think you folks know most of us, except for maybe Senator uh, Parent. 
So well, go ahead, Amanda. Welcome, Senator. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, my name is Amanda St. Pierre, and I'm currently serving as the Executive Director of Vermont Dairy Producers Alliance. I also farm here in Berkshire with my family, um, and I appreciate an opportunity to be before you again, as I said. Um, the Vermont Dairy Producers Alliance is comprised of dairy farmers and industry partners in the farming industry representing dairy as well as other agricultural farms of all sizes throughout the Vermont. The Alliance works together with members, industry partners, and state government to adopt regulations that won't cripple the economy, economic viability of the Vermont dairy industry. The Alliance supports and encourages the growth and viability of agriculture in Vermont while being mindful of the environmental impacts to Vermont's working landscapes and waterways. The Alliance was formed to increase the voice of dairy farming, both within the legislative and regulatory arenas. Members are from farms of all sizes working in conjunction with industry members to ensure a sustainable dairy sector in Vermont. We think that we have brought together a group of members today that will provide you with COVID-19 experience and how they have tried to make it through. We believe that you will hear that milk prices are very important, but through the pandemic, the expense side of the ledger has created much angst among members. As we move away from the pandemic, you will hear that the next 12 months are not going to be rosy. And looking back to 12 months ago, dairy producers were anticipating a good year ahead as well. Obviously this has not happened, but you will hear testimony showing that um, with the help of government assistance, both federal and local state government, we have made it through. I would like to introduce now the new chair of the VDPA Board of Directors, Brian Carpenter, uh, to submit testimony on our behalf. Yeah, uh, thank you, Amanda, and welcome, Brian. Uh, it's uh, good to have you with us. Thank you, Senator Starr and, and Senate Ag Committee. It's been a couple of years, I believe, since I've testified in, in your committee, Senator Starr. Um, yeah. So for those who don't know me, my name is Brian Carpenter. I'm the principal owner of Champlain Valley Equipment, and I'm currently serving as the chair of the Vermont Dairy Producers Alliance. I joined the Alliance back when uh, we first founded the Alliance as, a, uh, as an allied business and uh, see the very need to, to promote dairy within Vermont. And I'll talk about that in my testimony. Um, our business, Champlain Valley Equipment, operates four locations in Vermont. We employ roughly 100 full-time employees. Uh, <clears throat> our business was founded in 1970. My father, uh, we were far dairy farmers ourselves, and uh, he, he moved from dairy farming to farm equipment in 1970. Uh, we're proud of our service and support to much of Vermont, just to give you an idea of uh, how important to Vermont's uh, economy some of the allied businesses are. In 2020, uh, CVE paid out $5.3 million in wages to our employees. Uh, remitted, we remitted over $1.3 million in sales taxes and $166,000 in personal Vermont income tax withholdings to the state of Vermont. Our single largest industry in the main state of our equipment, sales, parts, and service, which drives our employment numbers, is Vermont's dairy industry. And that's all of the farmers, not just, uh, you know, we have some larger farms on the, on the call today, but it's, it's all of the Vermont dairies. Our, family is, our family's business is many years of observing and participating and the ups and downs of dairy, which has been sometimes robust while well, at other times struggling. We've watched through the years as trends emerge or rules and regulations promote or mandate new farming practices. These acts affect not just the dairies, but all of us involved in agriculture throughout the state. Vermonters in the ag industry have spent a great deal of time, effort and energy identifying the best agricultural practices focused on preserving our water, soil, and air. Technology and innovation enable today's producers to track exactly how many and where seeds were planted, how much fertilizer, pesticide, and herbicide was applied, and how much was harvested. 
This is all vital data to both producers in Vermont if we are to preserve and protect our environment. Marie Adet of Blue Spruce Farm wrote an article that was published in Vermont Digger, which reflects these actions being taken by many of our Vermont dairy farmers. The modern dairy is run by professional business people, constantly learning how to care for their land and animals better. They regularly attend classes and seminars, involve themselves in conservation groups, and read trade magazines to grow their abilities to focus on maintaining healthy soils, which will return bountiful nutrient-rich crops. Over the years, I've witnessed extraordinary change within agriculture and within the agricultural equipment market. <laughs> Technology and innovation has enabled today's producers to accomplish in one day what might have taken several days or a week in 1970. For example, a big M can cut, crimp, and windrow a hayfield at the rate of 20 plus acres per hour, and that's a, a large self-propelled mower. In 1970, each process required both a special piece of equipment and separate pass, and that 20 acre field might have consumed a day. I've also watched what feels like extremist views vilify our dairy farms. Recently, some espoused the need to transition Vermont's dairy producers to organic for a variety of reasons. Just a couple years ago, even a former agricultural secretary of Vermont jumped on board this argument when our dairy producers were struggling with persistent low pricing. The wisdom of that idea seems to have been proven misinformed as the organic pricing followed suit with in commodity drops in pricing last year and limits to their producers. Of note, the 203 organic dairies we had in 2016 has now dropped to 187. We're limited by the markets we can develop, our infrastructure, the types and quality of our soils for pasture land, our debt structures and other things that are not easily shifted without sending shockwaves through the Vermont economy. In the past decade, our dairy farm numbers have dropped by 38%, while the dairy cow numbers in Vermont has dropped only 10%. The change has been rather steady if you look at the USDA dairy data. In fact, our cow numbers dropped 10% in the prior decade as well. Of note, the total number of pounds shipped has remained fairly steady, reflecting a steady value to Vermont's economy that few other Vermont industries can boast about. Every county in the state has active dairy operations, the smallest of which is in Bennington County with nine and the largest in Franklin with 110 dairies. <clears throat> like many other industries, including my own, consolidation is being driven by cost increases. For instance, that big M mower that I referred to sells for $350,000, whereas the popular motor, mower of 20 years ago sold for approximately $30,000. By margin reductions, by the need to professionalize, the aging of our farm owners, farm labor availability, and various other influences, many of which we have no control over. There's this current push for diversification and that seems reasonable, but to be forthright, this has been occurring for a long time naturally. Our dairies also produce maple syrup. They grow commodities, farm pumpkins, host tourism via bed and breakfasts, board horses, raise beef, hogs, produce, or other products marketable at roadside stands or farmers markets. A couple of years ago, some farmers placed faith in the budding CBD market and planted acreage into hemp. To remain viable, some dairies have grown, some shifted to organic, some added diversity or niche on the farm processing, and some have exited. My belief is that we should be slow and steady in our promotion of solutions to the dairy industry that we should be careful to understand the second order impacts of any proposed new rules, and that we should challenge those who oversimplify the impacts of changing our regulatory environment on the business plans our farmers have created given existing rules. After all, we compete in a national or even a world market and Vermonters must in the end 
remain competitive to survive. And that impacts all of us. I talked, we, we were just talking with the House Ag Committee. And when you look at uh, our neighboring states that have lost the larger farms and the dairies that supported the infrastructure, we need that those larger operators to keep the infrastructure whole and otherwise the infrastructure starts to crumble and it impacts the rest of the state and all other farmers involved. I trust that our VDPA organization can be a resource and work with you to help provide ground truths, how various bills and proposed regulations impact those of us working in the rural country <coughs> of Vermont. We're currently working with Heather Schuldice and her team at William Schuldice and Associates to ensure our availability for testimony or for a consult should you have uh, a need on any to, to get a, a thoughts, our thoughts on, on any bills that you're looking at. And we have some of our farmers that are part of the, the uh, BDP Alliance, they're here to justify how it's impacted on the farm in the past year. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, I know, uh, you know, you and your company uh, has um, been a great help to our ag uh, community, supplying equipment and services, and, and uh, you've been a player uh, in this for a long time, and and we certainly all appreciate your your uh, steadfast uh, work in this direction. Um, so thanks a lot for being with us uh, this morning, and and certainly um, we um, we've always or I've always worked uh, in our committee has worked closely with your the organization. Uh, because you got quite a crew. Um, and if you added up all the milk that came from the membership from uh, you folks, it would, it would take a few trailers to, to uh, hold it all. Um, so anyways, um, I don't know uh, if uh, uh, Bord Mr. Bordeaux's on next or who you'd like to have on next, Brian. Did um you want if I could just interject, Senator, I would like to invite um, Josh Pullen of Pullen Industries to speak yeah. on behalf of the industry and as a dairy farmer. Um, and if um, Jacob Bordeaux can join, I will let you know. Yeah, very good. And um, be uh, glad to hear from Josh. Uh, he's a, almost a neighbor, uh, just lives a few miles away from, from me and been... Um, uh, family friends for forever, I guess, uh, goes way back into the 50s or 40s. So uh, welcome, Josh, and um, good to have you with us and uh, glad to hear from you. Thanks, Mr. Starr. Um, I, uh, so I'll start by talking about the, um, the feed, obviously the feed business. So um, we have, we'd have two separate, separate entities kind of inside of our feed business. We have our bag division, um, and then we have our, our bulk division, which is primarily, obviously, um, obviously, uh, mostly primarily dairy. We have a few beef customers and a few people that melt goats and those sort of things, but most of it's, um, most of it's, uh, you know, dairy. Um, so, uh, I guess I guess the biggest challenge um, we've seen, and, and, I, and I, so I, I, I guess I should explain a little so everybody knows, but um, I'm the president of Pool and Grain here. Um, we own four facilities, one here in Newport, Vermont, uh, one in Swanton, Vermont, one in Bennington, Vermont, and one in Canton, New York. So we have a pretty, the only facility that we bag feed out of is the one here in Newport. Um, the other three facilities are strictly bulk, um, mostly dairy feeds. Um, so, um, and then I also own a farm. Um, my grandfather, my great grandfather was a farmer. My farm, my, my grandfather farmed, my uncle farmed and uh, now I farm. So, um, so I, I've, I've got to see both ends of it, I guess, during this, um, at least on the feed side. So 
Um, I guess uh, for the most part, um, the dairies have, from an accounts receivable standpoint with us, have held their own. Um, I think there's been a lot of challenges, um, both big and small, with dairies, given, you know, looking at what was going to happen going into 2020, as we would call a normal year, and then all of a sudden ending up with a pandemic and milk price shifts and markets and base programs and, you know, all the, all the fun stuff that's happened um, in this year. So, uh, as I said, as far as our accounts receivable go from the dairy end, it, that stayed, I think, given a lot of the government programs and, and some of the money that was, was, was laid forward, PPP and some of the other programs um, early on in this kept everybody, uh, I guess, even, if you will. So I think that was, was needed. Um, so now we kind of go uh, to where we are today. Um, the, well, I'll, I'll talk about our bag business. Our bag business was, was one of those businesses that was kind of the timing was right. Uh, March is kind of when people generally look at buying chickens and pigs and so on and so forth, if they're going to. And given we had this, I think with people being worried about food security and some of those other things, they really, uh, our bag business is, <clears throat> has grown probably, uh, I don't know, I'll say seven or eight percent here in this year, given the, yeah. just the, I mean, it's just luck, right? I mean, that, that part of the business, I guess, is what people were doing and where, how they felt and probably some of these other, other this other stimulus money from the federal government with unemployment and some of that other stuff. People were at home, they had time to take care of animals, whatever it may have been. So, so um, I guess that's um, in the right place at the right time with that one. But um, on the dairy side, like I said, they've held their own. Um, we've had internally had some labor struggles given the whole, you know, fears and, you know, everybody has, you know, no one really, not everybody has the same feeling about how this pandemic is. So um, like I told the house committee, I'm tired, but as long as everybody else is, is trucking along, all right, it, it'll be okay. Managing has been, been, been extremely hard, both, for the dairy end of the business and, and on the farm level. I think probably a lot of these producers that are on the line today are, are have probably had a, a lot of a lot of different management things they weren't expecting. So um, now we're so where I'm concerned about dairy going forward is I don't know what this looks like. Um, <clears throat> but given the 13% reduction um, in 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 milk that was be able to produce if you're a DFA customer or capping your yourself on last year's production if you're an agri-market producer um, which are the two biggest co-ops that dairies in the state would ship to um, and now if if anyone follows markets um, the grain markets have have exploded I guess for lack of better words um, we've seen 120 to 150 dollar increase in in uh, whether corn or soy are the major ingredients here over the last three to four months while milk has stayed relatively flat and we're still on a base type program where, you know, we're, so I think that, that when that happened, there was money available for the dairy, you know, okay, we're getting these programs and all this stuff going on, but dairies are still, whether you're buying base from other farms, or you're trying to consolidate, um, basically the co-ops are telling you that we want less milk, right. And, and we're going to, we're going to pay you for a, you know, uh, basically demand milk and then surplus milk, you're getting a different number for. And, and it's created a lot of different challenges. Not that the, if there wasn't enough before in dairy, now we've got these new ones that basically <clears throat> create more, uh, uh, more uh, unpredicted uh, futures as time goes on with, with, with what we're going to, what we're going to see, whether the base stays, if you DFA 13%, it goes to 10, goes back to 15 um, you know, okay, that over that oversupply milk today, you might get you might get sixteen dollars for it this month, and you might get five dollars for it next month. You know, who who really knows how those things are going to play out? Um, and when you're trying to run a business, and growth has been a pretty important part. Um, Brian touched on that just barely. You know, uh, cow numbers have you know he said down ten percent, farms down I think thirty percent or something down thirty. You know. Um, you know, uh, cow, cow, uh, farms down 30%. So 10% <clears throat> still a lot to me and 30% is a real lot when you start talking about, um, available uh, customers and, and who we're going to deal with and, and other States and competing with, 
with with kind of the country and the world as time goes on. Um, I think we have our advantages. We don't always talk about them as much, uh, but we also have some disadvantages, right, which we tend to lean on more. Uh, but as time goes on here, I think um, – I think the challenge is going to be that that's created another unknown and, and they've still, no matter what, what group you're in, whether you're an agromech or a DFA producer, you definitely took a, a big, a big hit to your bottom line. And, you know, um, when you look at, you know, how you're going to pay for things and the cost of business just going up every year, um, Brian had a great example with a big M, right? $30,000 back in 30 years ago and now $350,000 now. And, and feed's no different. When I started in this business, we were we used to sell cornmeal for 89 bucks a ton. And now, you know, if you get it for 220 bucks a ton, you're I guess today you're you have a deal. So um, I, I think going forward, the state and 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 I think everyone in food production needs to start thinking about how this how these things are going to look. Maybe not only just in dairy, but uh, it, there's definitely in dairy going to be some challenges. Um, with the recent increase um, in feed prices and kind of the dairy staying level. And um, so I, I, I think I appreciate all the programs and the stuff that people have done federally and statewide, but I, I think the, the tougher months are to come um, for dairy farmers here in, 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 in the beginning of 2021 here, and maybe through most of the year. <laughs> so uh, I guess that's a, a brief overview about where we're at industry wise. Um, it definitely hasn't been an easier year to, to, to be in business, but overall, uh, like I said before, I think, I think for at least in a essential business where, where we've been able to continue and, and hopefully we can continue to provide and, 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 and help the dairies in the state and, and uh, you know, and, and move forward. Uh, thank you. I, thank you, Josh. Um, you uh, talked about, you have, uh, four sites, three of them are here in Vermont. Um, could you tell, tell the committee uh, how many states do you deliver feed to though that's coming out of, out of Vermont here and out of your uh, plan over in Canton? Uh, you're on mute, Josh. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to be good with the mute button there, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll come into it. Uh, so we deliver, uh, thanks for the question. We, we deliver, um, you know, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, <laughs> a little bit into Maryland, and then obviously all of New York. And uh, we're, 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 set, we're shipping some of our bag feeds to Ohio and Florida. So we, we cover a, we cover a pretty, uh, a pretty big region out of Vermont and we're pretty proud of having, uh, you know, the, the, those plants here and being able to do that. So, so pretty, uh, pretty nice having, us. well, you're not a small company, but certainly started small here in Vermont, uh, shipping feed, uh, all over the North, all over the East coast really. And, um, so and anyways, it's good to, um, have you with us? You didn't bother to tell us anything about your dairy operation, but I just say that um, to the committee, it's a very modern type dairy operation. I think with about every everything that's up to date and and modern that you could possibly have with robotic milkers, right through to automatic cleaners and. No, it's quite an operation. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to take a minute just to explain that. <clears throat> yep, I, I can explain a little bit about that. Yeah, so I um, obviously super committed to dairy. It's how we started, similar to what Brian just said. And um, my grandfather is 96. Um, he thinks it's important that uh, he's still around. He thinks it's important that somebody farmed in the family. So uh, the rest of them ran. <laughs> So I'm the, I'm the guy and uh, I guess I'm the right one to do it because I really love it. And uh, so, yeah, I built a dairy and, and hence the, re, uh, you know, it's got automatic feeding. Um, so we have vectors, they're called vectors, um, uh, robotic milking, uh, automatic barn cleaning. And um, 
the hope was that, you know, you could figure out how to, um, I'm not sure I'd just be being honest without the other business that that could happen that way because <laughs> the investment in, 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 in those things is, is big. Um, but we have been able to produce and make really high quality product and, and, and do that pretty effectively with labor, which was, uh, I was hoping to figure some things out with that. And I think I figured out that it's given the economics today that, that's not really going to be possible um, just to start. I think if somebody's in the game and they've, they've started, you know, um, and you're doing those things, investing in some of the technologies um, as far as like activity and breeding and some of those, some of those other technologies that's there, you know, to help manage. Um, I think those, those can pay themselves back fairly quickly. Some of the other stuff is a little bit longer term investment. And hence the reason, like in my case, <clears throat> I need a full barn. I need to milk 365 cows in my barn. Uh, that's what it can milk comfortably. And um, I've been milking about 330 most of the year, given where our base program is. So when I look at what that costs me, um, what that does to people that are investing, um, whether it's in, in, in technology or whether it's Amanda or Bill or, or, or the Gladstones or any of the farms in the state, right? Um, the, you know, um, any of the guys we deal with, any of the smaller farms, bigger farms, doesn't matter. When they invest, even whether it's heifer barns or whatever it may be, you, you kind of got to be able to have the right number of cows in your barn and you got to have that milk going out the door. Um, and you got to be able to know at least, <clears throat> you got to have a good feeling that you're going to get paid. You've never really known exactly what you're going to get paid, but you had an idea. Now you've got, now you've got this other thing that's just, you know, a, a whole nother level. So, um, that's going to be a challenge. And, you know, there's been a lot of trade of base um, and different things between farms. And um, I've had to do a little of that. And I think some of the other farms have, you know, trying to, you know, we're in an infinite game. You know, the game's going to go on, whether it goes on in Vermont or New York or whatever these states may be. Um, you know, so I think as all without like finite games where there's defined rules, we don't have a lot of defined rules. Um, but we have a lot of we're just trying to outlast the next the, the next guy in the game and, and keep that here. And I think um, as we move forward, you know, like I said, in Vermont, we have some advantages, but um, for me, I got to be able to milk those number of cows. And I think if you talk to any other dairy producer in the state, um, taking that hit was, is going to continue to be quite a, quite a, 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 a process. And, and you need to be able to invest in those technologies and those, those, op, uh, you know, it's a capital intense business. Dairy farming is, I think people underestimate how, how much money it really takes to <clears throat> to get all this stuff done. So thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Josh. Amanda, who would you like to have, uh, have up next? I have a, our young farmer who um, is waiting on the phone to try to get in and he, it says no. it's, he's waiting. So I'm not sure how we do that. No, uh, I think if, I think uh, Linda, did he call Linda? He's trying to call the phone number on Zoom. Linda. Okay. I'm not seeing him in the waiting room. Okay, maybe you could just put in the chat a number he can call in. He's been having all kinds of technical difficulties this morning. And sure, I can, I'll, I can I'll send it to you. I'll send Thank it to you, you, Amanda. Thank you. Um, so I guess I would go to Shannon and then Stephanie. Yeah, um, so uh, Shannon, uh, you're up. Thank you. Uh, Chin Hill, part of Four Hills Farm here in Bristol, Vermont. Uh, we currently are milking 2,300 cows. Um, we are currently working on bringing in the next generation in um, to the farm. So we have two that are already come in as partners and two more that are, are working their way in as well. And so we're hoping to keep going. Um, as far as the pandemic goes, I hadn't really thought about this last time, but uh, we had, we're talking about the capping of how much milk we can ship. We had um, our cap and then COVID happened and our breeding program, which you start nine months before when you want something to happen, had us in March having 330 calves. And the cows don't know there's a pandemic and they don't know they're not supposed to give milk. So those first few months when we dumped truckloads, and when I say truckloads, I mean 65,000 pounds. <laughs> Every day? No, only only two only two at the end of the month because we couldn't go over our over the cap for the for the pandemic. But because of that whole program, we had started being a little more aggressive on sending beef that we wouldn't have done before. We you know cows that just weren't bringing back or that we might have tried again that we didn't. 
And so now we can't actually, we, we are even reaching our cap now because we made all these changes based on the pandemic. And it's going to take us another nine months to get caught back up again to where we were. So, you know, we already had a, we already had a cap planned and we had planned to meet it. It would have hit June, really. We would have hit our, our cap in June. That was the plan. And then the pandemic happened. And so uh, all the changes we made, and we really held off on the big changes until August or September on some of the bigger changes, um, but the dumping milk got to be too painful. And so now we're backpedaling. Now we're, now we're trying to get caught up to where we can be, where we want to be, which is really milking 2,500 cows and not 2,300. Yeah. And, and where do you, do you send your milk to one of the co-ops or? Or Agrimark. Yeah. And they, they cut their production by 10%, right? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. It, it was, a, it was a monthly thing. So it changed from month to month. They sent us, let, they sent us a letter at the beginning of each month telling us what we had to, what we could ship. Yeah. Is there, is there anything um, like the 25th check that co-ops used to do uh, with profit that they made from, you know, within their other businesses, uh, like in the cheese or butter business? Is there anything like that that happens uh, in today's world? They do do a dividend check once a year. Yeah. So that's I still those numbers. So I don't know if there will be a dividend check this year or not, but <laughs> we'll yeah. see. And um, so you're back. You you went from twenty three hundred animals to twenty five hundred now, or no? We we, we were headed for twenty five hundred, but we had to we we did a lot of heavy culling in yeah. those months when we were dumping milk. Yeah. So you had to cut quite a bit then or drop off quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. We, like I said, we were 200 behind where we wanted to be this time. And uh, did, did you folks take advantage of the um, uh, relief funds that uh, we or the federal government had out there and the state funds that we put together for, for dairy and other ag businesses? To Absolutely. Help? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I missed a one, including PPP, so. Yeah, good. Yeah, um, any questions uh, from the committee members for Shannon? If, if not, we'll move on uh, to the next speaker. Um, Linda, did the young farmer get through on the phone? Not yet. We can, we can go to Stephanie, um, Senator, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Welcome, Stephanie. Good morning. Thank Good. you all for having us today. Um, my name is Stephanie Pope, and I'm a third-generation farmer here in Addison County, right on the shores of Lake Champlain. Our farm was settled in 1958 and has been a dairy farm since 1958. We are current. Um, a medium farm operation and milk about 600 cows and farm between rented acres and home acres, 2,000 acres. Um, we have 10 full-time employees and five full-time family members. We also supply milk to a small creamery on the farm here. And um, when the pandemic hit, um, it went to pretty much zero. Um, we have built, or my sister has built, um, the, the creamery business backed up, but it's about a third of the supply of milk from um, 2019 to today. Um, when COVID hit in the beginning of 2020, we thought it was gonna be a great year. Cash flow looked good, markets looked good. Um, COVID hit and kind of ripped the carpet out from underneath us. I um, was lucky enough to be on the first round of PPP and that really saved us um, heartache and everything else. Um, we were able to keep all of our employees through the pandemic. And then um, I honestly went from um, being a laborer um, to sitting in my office and looking for programs and applying for programs, grants. Um, so every little bit helped, CFAP helped a lot. Um, now looking forward to the future, um, we signed up for the DMC, 
which um, cost us a $7,500 and it only, um, it only allots us 5 million pounds of milk or it's only covered up to 5 million pounds of milk. And then, so we also are doing the DRP program, but all this insurance is costing us about 40 cents um, per CWT per hundred weight, um, which is an, an expense that we've had before. Um, so it's, um, and all our milk is not covered. It's just too expensive to cover 100% of our milk, but we are um, trying to um, keep a floor, if you want, if you will, um, you know, so we can kind of plan ahead. Um, so that's our story of 2020. We hope that 2020 um, <laughs> one is a little better and um, we we're trying to, like I said, keep a floor underneath us at this point. Well, 2021 can't get much worse than 2020. <laughs> we're all going to be under water uh, for sure. Um, the uh, you said uh, that you have a small um, what is it a pasteurizing or homogenizing dairy plant at the farm? Yep. So my sister wanted to do, um, she wanted to stay in agriculture, but didn't want to, you know, be on the cow side. So we built a small creamery and she makes cheese. Um, and her niche has actually become cheese curds, um, believe it or not. So she, um, like I said, she uh, supplied like the chubby muffin. Um, it's a restaurant group in Burlington and, um, Obviously, when the pandemic hit, all her restaurants, um, you know, yeah. supply went to zero overnight. Um, and she's built it back up to about a third of what 2019 looked like. Yeah. So it's uh, cheese, not uh, not bottled milk or anything like that. So we looked into bottling milk and um, it's quite a process. And and we actually decided not to pursue it at this time. Yeah, I know, uh, of course, I live near the Canadian border um, and you go to Canada and every, every little store up there sells curd cheese. And, you know, it's, it's expensive, and it, but it's very good. And uh, you notice the day they get it in, by the end of the day, the bags are all gone. Uh, so, you know, that's a good little market to, to get into. And, and um, it's too bad we didn't have more stores uh, that carried it because curd cheese is a good, it's a good little snack with uh, potato chips and, you know, the good foods that we, we have to enjoy. Um, so anyways, are there questions from any of the committee members? No, so we'll um, we'll move on. Uh, has have we gotten a person? I don't. The I don't think he's going to be able to join us, and I apologize. And we'll have to get him back. Um, he has an interesting story, and I think you'd all be interested. So I'll work on getting him back before your committee. But I would like to point out a few things. Um, Brian Carpenter is our new chair of Vermont Dairy Producer Alliance, and we do have two new members testifying today. Stephanie is an, a welcome new addition and uh, Walt um, is now on our board, Walt Gladstone. And so he's going to speak next. Yeah. Uh, morning. Uh, uh, who is it? Walter? Walt? Yes, it's Walt. It's, I think yeah. it's written on my, I think it's written on my little cue there. My tile is Will, but it's, uh, it's Walt Gladstone. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Thank you, I, Senator Starr, for the. I was going to okay? say, by God, by God, Will looks just like Walt to me. But <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, if he was talking right now, most people would say we both sound the same. So we've got <laughs> that in common. Well, thank you for this opportunity this morning to speak to uh, <clears throat> you, senators. Um, I, we have I three you, sons. Can you hear me you okay? Froze, you froze up, uh, Walt. Okay. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, so I'll start again. So I'm Walt Gladstone. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here this morning. Uh, my wife and I own and operate Newmont Farm. We have three sons. Two of our sons are in business and in our partnership with us. And our third son, John, is a local independent trucker that helps us out with our uh, pumpkin operation. We've been here for 32 years. I can remember that pretty easily because that's the age of my oldest son. He was in my wife's belly the day that we bought this farm at auction. We currently, well, when we started out, I guess I want to even start back. I, I grew up in upstate New York, and I think this is a theme that I'll follow up at the end. But my dad had an operation of 34 cows, and we landed here in Vermont in 1988. And at that point in time, we were, gonna, we were milking 120 cows, and today we're milking on just under 1,600 cows. We have crop approximately 2,000 acres, and of that, we grow about 200 acres of pumpkins. We are proud to have the next generation farming with us, helping us provide management and labor. <clears throat> Just speak a little bit as uh, Josh and everyone else has to the last 12 months. As we all know, the pandemic uh, hit us and it really uh, softened up uh, uh, demand. And at that point in time, as it's been pointed out, the co-ops asked us uh, to reduce our milk. Our farm at that point in time, near had built a barn for our dry cows and cows. And uh, we actually populated a barn that was next to our parlor and we were gonna milk another 150 cows. In March, they asked us to reduce the amount of production on our farm that matched that number of cows. So that whole investment in that barn and all those cows, now we were supposed to drop our milk production by that amount. In the beginning, we started out by uh, uh, calling heavier and making some calls, but we as a farm made a decision that we actually bought some beast from farmers that wanted to uh, get out of the business at that point in time. Over the summer, uh, based on uh, people wanting beef and po pork, we actually started to uh, retail some uh, um, of our own beef and pork mainly marketed through social media. Um, a couple of things that we typically do on our farm is for the last five years, we've had an open farm day, the middle of the summer, that we open up our farm to the public. And uh, obviously with the uh, COVID, that didn't happen. The other thing that we do is twice a year to the five uh, neighboring towns, we put out a newsletter to talk about different things that are going on in the industry. And, and to uh, profile some of our employees. As we roll ahead in here to 2021, uh, I, I feel fairly optimistic about the first three months when we talk about milk price. And I say that a little bit uh, tongue in cheek, that, that optimism is based on most recently, the federal government has uh, put, I guess, $1.5 billion uh, toward uh, the food box program, maybe not all of it's in the food box, but that has each class three milk price by as much as $2.50. And when I say that, as of the last 24 hours, looking at class three, just to give you guys perspective, uh, the class three milk price for February has actually dropped $1.50 in the last uh, 24 hours. So sure. the people that I try to lean on to learn about milk price, uh, looking ahead this year, they predict that the milk price, our milk price, mailbox price, will probably fall somewhere between 14 and $19. So that's kind of the revenue side of it. Uh, grain prices, as Josh pointed out, um, last summer, I remember this because I was listening to this uh, this tape uh, that was recorded almost every day. But once I got into pumpkin season in September, I stopped. 
at the end of August, the people that I was leaning on to listen to, they really felt that the grain market was long and we didn't have any real concerns and pressures that we needed to buy ahead on grain. Well, when that storm went through Iowa last summer and a lot of that corn went down, uh, as of today, um, as Josh pointed out, the major ingredients, corn and soy, are up between 40 to 50 percent. And, you know, as I hear it, which is something that we all need to pay attention to, many of us farmers don't have a lot of that booked ahead. So a year ago at this point in time, uh, we had we had in earlier years bought some milk insurance uh, to get some price protection. But to be honest with you, you know, uh, we did it uh, enough times, never saw any return. And as a family without a lot of experience, we opted out. Well, when the, when the pandemic came along and COVID and, and the milk price had just dropped uh, by such a large margin, um, we all started to realize as dairy farmers, we better pay attention to this milk insurance. And so I think many of us at this point in time have bought uh, DRP. And the thing that's interesting for you folks to realize, you know, we're buying it like we all might have fire insurance at home. We hope that it won't pay out, but you know, you're talking about 30 to 50 cents, a hundred weight. And when you start figuring that, that what that means as a margin, those are really big dollars. Um, we also participated in the other, uh, 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 it's called DMC insurance. And as I think uh, um, one of the gals pointed out earlier, you know, we only have insurance on that up to 5 million pounds. And yeah. why that is, it's not that we can't buy more, but it's so price prohibitive and it costs so much. And my point is, and I'm happy for those smaller farmers that get it at such a price reduction, but as you get up over 5 million pounds, the government's decided they are not going to sub subsidize it at the that same level. Uh, so I guess a few of the, the, the messages that I'd like to just speak to a little bit is um, as, as uh, Brian and Josh had talked about earlier, you know, we all know about how, how technology is, is making this industry change so fast. And the reality of it is, you know, it comes at a big price tag and not everyone else is gonna, we're not gonna all adapt it at the same time. And for me, and the reason I started out my conversation is I grew up on a, cow, a farm with 34 cows. I still want to be thought of as the same person. I still put my pants on the same way. And I don't know if I really want to be remembered and defined just based on how many cows I have. And my point here is I think that there, there's an important place for all of us guys, whether you're a small farm or a large farm, you think about technology, you think about all the infrastructure that we need, whether it's fertilizer companies, the grain companies, at some level, the larger farms are gonna help carry that infrastructure longer. And at some point that's gonna be a benefit to the smaller farmers. So I think that sometimes I get the sense that we ought to support the smaller farmers faster than the larger farmers. And I would contend we, we need to support all of us. All farmers. Yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, are uh, there questions for Walt from any of the committee members? Um, so, uh, Walt, uh, how was the pumpkin business? The pumpkin business was, uh, was really good. It was, uh, it kind of a little playing off that COVID, uh, people were staying more at home. I think that they, they wanted to decorate a little bit more. Um, I was sorry for the guys in Southern New Hampshire with the drought, their crop wasn't quite as good, but I was happy. I was glad to help those guys in their markets and provide some of these good Vermont pumpkins to them. Yeah, 200 acres of pumpkins. I wouldn't even want to have to count that many pumpkins. Uh, but that's a lot of, lot of pumpkins, and that's good if you could get rid of them. Now, if there's 
is that any kind of feed that you can feed uh, animals if there's no we can't. Left? Can you hear me, Bobby? Yeah. Uh, so, so, the, so the answer, so the answer is yes. That we, they can be fed oh. for 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 dairy. But the fact of the matter is I've often felt that it was too price prohibitive based on the labor to get them to the to the cows. Yeah. So I I just like to talk to that. And I meant to earlier, you know, I think labor is something that we have not mentioned. And, uh, you know, that that's a huge uh, part of our our cost structure, as we both know, labor and feed are our two biggest expenses. And uh, with minimum wage going up, um, it's it's just a real big concern. Uh, how do we uh, stay profitable based on margins and and the cost of business going up, and the availability of labor? Yeah, well, the the availability is probably the big issue. Yeah. That's right. Uh, what about um, you're down there on the Connecticut River? Do you grow any soybeans or or corn that you can use on your farm uh, for to mix in your feed rations? You know, we're we're blessed that we're farming on this really great land. To answer your question, we don't have enough land to do that. Could we do it if we had had more acres available? But right now, we're actually buying a couple hundred acres of both grass and corn uh, and, and, and diversifying some of our acres into pumpkins. Yeah, I'll yeah. be done. Yeah. Um, well, I know that's pretty good farmland down through there uh, if you can find it. Yeah. That's right. Um, other, any other questions from uh, committee members? If not, thank you, uh, Walt, and we'll be seeing you out Corey, uh, you have a question? Or? Yeah, it's not so much for Walt, but just for the whole group, you know, and I, I really appreciate everything you guys do. I don't know if you hear it enough. I I know as a senator from Franklin County, I know how important dairy is, not just the dairy farms, but businesses like Brian's. And, you know, I've got an industrial park full of uh, uh, manufacturers that require milk coming in the door to be productive. So um, we, we appreciate everything you do. Um you know, we don't have to, you know, necessarily, if you don't have the answers today, it's fine. But, you know, we hear the concerns, but what are one or two things we can do this year to help make your lives a little bit easier and your businesses a little more successful and sustainable? Uh, Amanda? Um, thank you for the, for the question, Senator. And I, and I think this is kind of where we're gearing up as we look at the next couple of years um, in, in really focusing on infrastructure. I think you're going to hear that theme a lot and how can we make the infrastructure further developed in our state and not in other states. I think truly where we've lagged behind is um, enticing um, that infrastructure to come here and, um, and that gives us more opportunities to be innovative and to diversify and to do cheese curds or uh, yogurts or you know whatever it is that you're going to do um, it does come down to infrastructure and that takes money. Um, and, and we're in a time where, you know, there's a lot of money going out the door and we're very appreciative of that. And we know that can't be sustained, but if some of that money could be diverted to more long-term uh, rebuilds of our economy, I think infrastructure. And I would just uh, quickly incur in uh, vocational education because um, we are facing a, a job crisis across our state and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Um, we all need, uh, we need people who can show up on time. We need people who can, you know, pass uh, a drug test. We need people who can, um, just do the very basic jobs and we can train, we can do in-house training. I don't think that really is the issue, but after COVID and the amount of stimulus money that went out, um, I, it's very hard to get people enticing to come and apply for jobs. And if they do apply for jobs to continue to show up. And I think if there's a way to promote uh, vocational training or job training across the board, it doesn't even have to be through the vocational ed programs. I think that would be a huge thing that our legislature could, could really work on uh, immediately as we look to recovering from COVID. And I, 
uh, pass the floor to Stephanie uh, to finish answering questions. Yeah, S Stephanie. I will absolutely reiterate what Amanda said with, um, you know, vocational training, on-job training for people, especially people out of work. Um, and also, um, you know, the permitting process, I know gets um, a little dicey here in the state, um, you know, whether it's the cost of the permit or just the process itself. So maybe look at some permitting process so, you know, businesses can expand easier or cheaper. Um, you know, I am an Agrimart member and I know we have heard at meetings before that, you know, they look <coughs> at their Shattergate plant to expand before the Middlebury plant um, solely on two things. Um, the permit process and also um, the labor issue. They have people lined up at their door um, in Chattagay. So when they are going to make a capital investment, they're probably going to look at Chattagay before they look at Middlebury for those two reasons. Yeah. Uh, if I could, if I, sorry, Senator. I just wanted to add one little piece um, to is the fact that the age group of which we're hiring the most of is above 50 years old. Oh, and, and, and honestly enough, the biggest group, uh, age group that we're hiring is, you know, people who are, who have retired, who want to continue to work. And that's between 60 and 75. So, I mean, that is quite an interesting perspective. And I think if efforts could be made in the younger generations, um, <laughs> that's really what, what needs to happen. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic. And I just wanted to put that, that piece out for consideration. <laughs> or, or yeah, I bet they show up every day too when they're supposed to. Um, but anyway, uh, Walt, yeah, you had your. Yeah, I, I just want to follow up to what these two gals have said. You know, regarding the permitting with our large farm permits right now, we've just went through the uh, how how tough it is in that economic environment out here in making decisions to to move ahead with our operations. There are not exact time frames that um, the ag department is working with us on if I want to do an addition. So if if I if I start the process, there, there there's no exactness to it, and that's real problematic. You know, it's problematic from a from a financing standpoint, from an economic standpoint, of where the markets are, and I I don't know if you people can have influence on that. But, you know, if we if we have at least if we know where the lines in the sand are, we can start to make decisions. But if, we, if there's no line in the sand, you know, you almost got to plan uh, ahead on something you think you might do even before you're going to do it. And to Amanda's comment on infrastructure, I don't know if she's specifically referring to it as well, but um, I really think the state needs to find more manufacturing opportunities uh, for or milk and and what can we do to try to um, bring interested parties here to this state <laughs> well I I think that's very important uh, to get some manufacturing in here to use up the milk because uh, the two major buyers have, have cut back on their their uh, taking of milk. Uh, we've got, you know, wonderful farmland and, and uh, whether it's growing crops or, or what, and we have excellent farmers that, that like what they're doing. And uh, yeah, we need more manufacturing. We're close to what, 60 million people uh, within a, a short day's drive of them. So, you know, we're sitting in the right place with the right amount of land and people willing to do the work if we could get the markets opened up. So, um, Amanda, who's up uh, next? Um, that that uh, concludes our formal testimony, but we'd love to open up um, for questions across the board. I think we have a uniquely diverse group that would be uh, happy to answer any questions you all would have. Yeah. Um, so are there, are, well, are there questions or more comments from any of you as well? Uh, you know, uh, Brian, uh, 
would you would you like to get back on? I, I just had two uh, comments, Senator Starr. Uh, one is a thank you for going uh, light on on change last year, but I I think we need to ask for that again this year. I, there's always pressure to to uh, really make significant changes to agricultural practices in the name of water quality. I, I think it's time to to let all the changes we've made uh, take full hold and, and see. I mean, there's just such significant change that's happened in the in the last five years that it would be really nice to wait and see the science of the the results of that, and especially. In 2021, as we continue to uh, have the impact of COVID, it, there's just too much to, to, for most of us business people to deal with to also have to factor in changes in our practices. We're trying to survive through this COVID. And so I, I would ask of the, of the committee to, to uh, take that into account as you, as you look at proposed bills. And then secondly, the, the, as the chair of of the town of Middlebury Select Board, uh, one of the things that we're working on and, and don't have, we really need state help on, and it comes down to the labor situation, is affordable housing for working class folks in Vermont. And so it's not in your committee, but it's something that we really need state support on. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Brian and before you folks got on, we had um, we had a group on talking about food security and ample food and how it's worked out. And uh, one of the comments from the Agency of Education was, "I hope I hope if you folks want to make changes that they're simple and and short, uh, because our plate is so full of." Uh, you know, these new programs that the feds are coming down with um, that's going to make it very difficult if we get into uh, serious uh, big time issues. Um, so are there other questions, uh, Brian, uh, Senator Collimore? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to mention that um, and not that everybody will agree with me. But to me, the watchword for the session is do no harm. And I think that can apply um, to a lot of different things, including the agricultural group we have here today. And I said the same thing when we have the uh, Agency of Education. And I think all too often we maybe uh, don't let enough time go by to see how things are working before we kind of knee jerk reaction um, with something that might even be worse. So I, I'm in full agreement with, uh, with Brian Carpenter on that. Um, Mr. Chair, I do have to leave. I have a weekly meeting with the uh, governor and the administration at noon. So I Boy, just wanna... you're, you're really moving up in the world yeah. if the governor will meet with you. Well, I don't know that he'll be there today because he's quarantining, but um, <laughs> maybe he will be. But I just wanted to thank all the uh, the folks from uh, the dairy groups around the, uh, the state and the farmers. And uh, Shannon, I go by your place every time I I'm still refereeing ice hockey games. So I leave from Rutland, I go up 116 and I go by your place uh, on my way to Burlington. And I'm always impressed with uh, with your farm there at Four Hills. So thanks for what you guys all do. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Brian. Have a good meeting with your with your with with the governor. Tell him he's doing a good job. Yeah, he's your governor too, Senator. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he's our governor, and, but uh, they have done a heck of a good job uh, with all the problems that we've been facing. And uh, getting back to Walt uh, for a second, in regards to that permitting and the timing, uh, there's no reason why uh, we can't speak with people at the Ag Agency and a &R to try to put some type of uh, a limit on on that, uh, I know, you know, I went through uh, an Act 250 hearing uh, last year, and they were they were real good about timing. I mean, if you got your paperwork in in a timely fashion, they would get right back and 
there's no reason for for ag to drag that on and and uh, be a long drawn out process. So we'll talk with <clears throat> with Anson and the other crew over there uh, about about that issue. Are there are other. We say that five. I, go ahead, Walt. Well, I. I really appreciate that. Um, I really appreciate that, Senator Starr. And along with that, if we want to dive into one more of the weeds, um, you know, farms that have got land base and and waste storage facilities large enough to milk in a thousand cows, body land and waste storage. You're kind of breaking up. Wall. Addition on my barn for two hundred. It's it's a huge amount of time, and just we'll sit them in doing it. And what 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 can we do to kind of? I we can't hear you all. Well, you've even lost your screen now. I'll ask Walt to send that um, comment to the committee um, just so he can he can follow up with that, Senator Starr. Yeah, um, yeah, and you know you could send it, he could send it, but the main thing is to uh, try to get it so we can look at it. And um, so I I guess that's going to kind of wind us up today, but. Uh, Thanks a lot for your time this morning, and hopefully um, you can join us um, a week from tomorrow when we get that report from um, uh, Michael Pishak in regards to the dairy pricing. I mean, what I've read through, it's, uh, it's a very heavy subject, and it'll be good to hear it from him, I think, uh, to, uh, to try to analyze what his people found out in regards to that. And I would um, just like to say on behalf of us um, to your committee, we really appreciate your efforts last year and uh, funding the COVID relief for our dairy industry and your work was, uh, we can't say enough how much we appreciate it. And we thank you for your time and look forward to ongoing discussions. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll get some more money but it looks like this first batch that's coming going to pretty much be handled through uh, the feds, the feds, and uh, I guess it's more than half they're going to control, and we'll get some for different subject areas. But it, it's going to be pretty well defined. There isn't going to be much loose money uh, like we had last year, where we could get quite a little bit for for our dairy folks. And oh, we uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll stay on top of it. Uh, Chris is over in uh, finance and I'm across the hall in appropriations in the afternoon. So we'll we'll stay awake and on top of it if we if we get any. Yeah. So again, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I know Brian and and uh, Josh uh, gave up the business time to be with us and all you farmers uh, in your business time. So thanks again. And um, if, you, if you ever run across something that you think we should hear and know about, uh, feel free to call any one of us uh, or call Linda and we'll, we'll schedule you into a meeting.